When I first watched this hearing, I thought, some interesting motions. Then I realized the backstory was way more interesting. So this is BJ Brown. He lived in New Orleans with his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Cassandra Jones. She's shown here, beautiful woman with her three beautiful daughters. They had a tumultuous relationship. She filed a restraining order in the past, but didn't show up to court to finalize it. Fox 8 has obtained a copy of the 25-page temporary restraining order Jones filed in May. It alleges Brown punched, choked, shoved, kicked, threatened, intimidated, and sexually abused her, along with mental, emotional, and financial abuse. It details an early morning incident, April 27th, around 3.30, when Brown allegedly came over and they began to fight. Jones says she told him to get out and he hit her with a belt several times, bruising her. 911 was called and Jones says Brown punched her and threw her to the ground, stomping on her. Once police arrived, she says Brown jumped off of her upstairs balcony to escape. After the officers left, she says he got back into her apartment where they continued to fight and he tried to smother her with a pillow. She also alleged there was another occasion where she confronted him about cheating on her and he punched her, knocking her teeth out. However, Jones never showed up to court to follow through with the restraining order. She worked for the clerk of courts, and the story of how she got the job is pretty awesome. First City Court Clerk Austin Badon hired Jones about a year ago. He met her when she was seeking emergency rental assistance, but what she really wanted was a job, and he saw her potential. We sat and we talked, and she had the attributes that I was looking for. She had the computer skills. She had people skills, and I saw somebody who was looking not for a handout. They wanted to work. The morning of the incident, Cassandra was in the parking lot near her car getting ready to leave for work. Around the same time, a resident in a second floor apartment heard what he thought was a gunshot. He looked out the window and saw a man walking across the parking lot with a gun in his hand. He started filming on his cell phone. He saw the man walk across the parking lot to a woman who was lying on the ground, already shot in the back, and shoot her two more times. I'm not sure if he called the police immediately, but he uploaded the video to social media, and of course, it went viral. Right now, the search continues for a man New Orleans police say shot and killed a woman on Iberville Street, then drove to Middle Tennessee. After the incident, Jones traveled from New Orleans straight up to Tennessee, about 500 miles away. It was there that an officer tried to pull him over. Then Monday night, that's when Brown was pulled over just off 149 here in Aaron for a traffic stop. Now, we attained this surveillance video where you can see Brown firing several shots at an errant police officer while the officer was still in his patrol car. The officer also firing back shots as Brown runs away with his handgun. That's the last time we saw him on camera. So then the manhunt ensued across the state of Tennessee. We will not rest until he's captured, justice is served, whether it be by a jury or Jesus. This is the first time we've experienced this within our department. We're, we're a six-man department. Aaron Police Chief Mark Moore said Brown ran into the woods after the shooting. A 30-plus hour statewide manhunt led to Brown's arrest early Wednesday morning in Tennessee. I'm overjoyed. And I'm not surprised he would open fire on a police officer. Brown is no stranger to St. John the Baptist Parish Sheriff Mike Trake. He says since 2010, his deputies have arrested Brown more than 15 times for crimes involving drugs, weapons, and high-speed pursuit. This hearing that we're going to look at Jones is facing the attempted murder charge of the police officer. They're trying to rush the hearing and get it done as soon as possible so that they can transport him back to New Orleans so he can answer for his crimes there. And the family of Cassandra Jones can finally get justice. Said in a statement, Cassandra was a vibrant lady who was loved by many people. She had a personality that would definitely light up a room. Our hearts have been ripped apart. She meant the world to us. So this is the motion hearing in the B.J. Brown case in front of Judge David Wolf. All right, uh, this is the state of Tennessee versus B.J. Brown. It is uh, a, a Houston County uh, case originating in the Circuit Court of Houston County, where the defendant is charged with attempted first degree murder. The um, parties by agreement have transferred venue 
to Dixon County, Tennessee, and we are now set for trial uh, on Thursday of this week. And the defense has filed a number of different motions. So Mr. Spratt, we're gonna let you take them up in the order that you filed them. Yes, sir. I think some of these are not contested from what I understand. Right, Judge, which would probably necessitate me going a little bit out of order. That's right. um, Motion number five, uh, <clears throat> I, I filed uh, motions four, five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, motion number five is a motion to have the case declared extended and complex. The state has no uh, issue with that motion. Uh, I would just ask that the court allow me, based on the, the allegations in the motion, to submit an order of uh, finding of undue hardship and extended complex under the rule for funding on that. Uh, I don't have a problem with declaring it extended and complex. Okay. So that, that would take care of, of number five. Uh, <clears throat> number six, uh, I'm right. Number six, uh, Judge, when we, when we litigate it, motion number four shortly, uh, motions six and seven were filed in a direct response to, to the motion number four with the PowerPoint, but the state has said again, that they do not plan to call any witnesses from the U.S. Marshals or the New Orleans Police Department in this case. There's a standing order from this court that was agreed to by the state to not reference anything that happened in New Orleans. So when I got the piece of what they call evidence that triggered me to file motion number four, I then filed motions six and seven. And your motions were based upon the fact that the PowerPoint presentation that was presented to you by the state had reference to events in, occurring in Louisiana and the defendant's location, and it also referenced a crime scene there um, where I think the defendant was maybe charged or is at least accused of, of a murder in Louisiana. <clears throat> That's correct, Your Honor. Um, and from my understanding, they're agreeing to motions six and seven. Um, I want to clarify that obviously if there's if they're using a PowerPoint showing his movements, then I want to know what I want to hear from the state about what their intentions are. I mean, I understand they're not intending to use the evidence of witnesses or police department, but if they're going to use the PowerPoint, I need to we need to kind of figure out what we're going to do about that. So let me hear from Mr. Uh, Crouch or Mr. Turnbow about that particular point. Judge, we'll come if back I if I may briefly say something about that before they respond, that does say crime scene right there in the, in the middle of the PowerPoint, but I don't understand the relevance of his movements up until the time of the events that are alleged to have occurred in Houston County, uh, just under a general, general relevance objection, uh, as well as a potential 403. And the venue's been moved in this, in this case once. I think any reference to to another state is just asking to, to make it hard to pick a jury or have an impartial jury. So you think, wait a minute, you think just the evidence that he was coming from another state would make it hard to get an impartial jury? Well, it, I just don't, I mean, the, there was some news coverage of this case and I just, I don't see the relevance to it at all. This is alleged to have occurred as a traffic stop, a traffic stop in Houston County. It went about a quarter of a mile, maybe, maybe a half a mile, I'm not sure. But that's when all, everything that he stands accused of in this indictment occurred right there in Houston County. And one of the slides in the PowerPoint uh, triangulates a, a, a cell phone as to being at that, that, that scene. I, I certainly think that would be fair game, uh, but I just don't see any need to track that. He, he's not accused of anything criminally in this state that backs up any farther than that. So I, I just don't see the relevance in it and the danger of unfair prejudice. I mean, it could easily trigger some memories of news coverage of the case and potentially cause a mistrial or any number of things. So I, I don't, it's not, it's not necessary. It's not relevant to any element of any offense that he's charged with here. It's not even remotely relevant to any of it. So I'm not arguing your motion without me hearing from the state as to whether or not they agree with you on everything. They, they don't agree with me on motion four, I'm fairly certain. So I'll, I'll, I'll yield. Mr. Crouch, <coughs> you 
Well, Judge, which motion am I arguing? There's several here. I, I'm going to start with number four because that, that addresses the PowerPoint specifically. What the state intends to offer is a PowerPoint that charts uh, the pings on the defendant's cell phone as he leaves uh, New Orleans and drives to Aaron, Tennessee. Now, Mr. Sprout was correct when Agent Valley initially prepared the PowerPoint. He did identify a location in New Orleans as, quote, crime scene. And we have removed that from the PowerPoint. We do not intend to have the words crime scene in New Orleans. It's simply uh, a, a charted plot of all the locations of Mr. Brown as he was driving to Houston County. <clears throat> Here's why that's important and relevant. One, uh, Mr. Spratt said this was simply a traffic stop. But that's not exactly how it went down. There was a traffic stop and then a two-day manhunt for an unknown person because he was driving in a car that was registered and owned by somebody else. So we didn't have the identity of the person that shot Officer Tiber during uh, the actual manhunt and, and directly after the shooting. So one, it goes to the identity of the defendant, the person responsible for this crime. Uh, two, it goes to his location and apprehension. Uh, I mean, they charted this uh, cell phone to see where he was, is at the time, and where he might be going. Uh, and then finally, it goes to the corroboration uh, of his confession, of parts of his confession, and also to uh, show some of the lies that he told uh, in his confession. So it's, you know, all of the Legal issues that Mr. Spratt raises, 401, 402, and 403, are, are satisfied uh, based on what we intend to show at trial. <clears throat> that, that is uh, the PowerPoint issue. But let me show the court, if I may, in part of my argument, the video that Mr. Spratt is referring to. <clears throat> May I ask to clarify which video he's asking to show? So, so Mr. Spratt is referring to a crime scene location, and we're going to show the, the video that he mentions in his motion of this homicide that occurred in New Orleans. Judge, it's it's I, a 10 second clip. Judge, I, I object to this if this needs to be taken off YouTube if we're going to do this. I well, object. If he's going to show what I think he's going to show. Well, that's the point of this hearing, Judge. He can, you can show, he can show whatever I allow him to show. But what, what I don't know is what is this particular thing. And number two, this is a public proceeding, and that's the reason that we live stream these things. Anyone who is called as a juror in this case will be questioned about whether they have read or seen or heard anything about this case prior to the, to the time they're called as a juror. And as a result of that, it, it, I don't think there is any basis for, I mean, we hear pretrial motions all the time. The uh, different courts handle it differently. Uh, what exactly is the is the video of your attempt you want right, to show? Th this is a video that is obtained by a cell phone of a resident of uh, a location on Iberville Street in New Orleans. He is on the second or third floor in his apartment, and he films the defendant uh, walking down a sidewalk uh, wearing a pair of orange tennis shoes that are recovered uh, in Houston County, in Aaron, Tennessee, in a shed and a rifle that appears to be and after testing is confirmed to be the same rifle that was located in houston county and mr brown in this video walks up to uh, his ex-girlfriend and shoots her with this rifle and that is shown on the video it's shown on the video but judge here's when mr spratt is arguing that prejudicial this video is already on the internet this video went to the internet before it went to law enforcement in Louisiana. This man was filming from his apartment and posted it on Instagram or TikTok or something. So anybody that wanted to watch this video can certainly already watch it. They're, the public is not gonna be learning anything new here, but we wanna give your honor some context as to these upcoming motions, five, six, seven, and eight, as to how things are relevant uh, to the investigation in this case. And I think this video, when you see the other additional proof the apparent. Mr. Spratt, I'm going to allow the playing of the video and I'm not going to stop the live stream from it because of the simple fact that it, it is a public proceeding and uh, any juror that potential juror that uh, would have seen anything about this would be disqualified anyway. So we will proceed with mm -hmm. that and 
As soon as I ask to have the video authenticated then before it's played. Authenticated? Yes. Well, it's not being introduced as evidence at this point. It's being introduced as a basis for, if before it would come before a jury, then yes, I would agree with you. But as far as authenticating it for the purposes of this hearing, I will rule your objection and, and uh, allow it to be played. Bro, the lady just got fucking shot outside my crib, bro. Oh my fucking god, bro. So, Judge, this video has nothing to do with the PowerPoint that we're showing. This video ultimately is going to uh, what Mr. Spratt is arguing under the enhancement issues. What you have just seen is a first degree murder in New Orleans. Uh, as corroboration of that, this rifle was recovered in Houston County and ballistics testing was compared. So we have the same weapon that was used to commit a murder on June 27th of 22, 2022 in New Orleans and then an attempted first degree murder in Houston County on the same day, uh, June 27th of 2022. Same weapon and those orange shoes that you saw in New Orleans on the feet of the man in the video were recovered in a shed in Houston County. So <clears throat> again, arguing uh, one of these motions, specifically the enhancement motion, the state has never offered any plea in this case, except to the maximum possible punishment. And now the court knows why, uh, because the man committed a murder. That's motion that he's arguing before I've even had a chance to argue that one. Well, and I would have to agree with Mr. Spratt there, General, that, that what we're essentially dealing with at the moment is the uh, number six, I think it was, that we were on, and that's the use of the, or the barring evidence from U.S. Marshals and New Orleans Police Department. Okay. <clears throat> so the that's question right. that I have in regards to what there was a prior order that went down that said that we're not going to get into your case in chief as to the basis for or, or that the, the crime committed in Louisiana in your case in chief in that's, this case. That's correct. And we're not. Okay. Uh, we're, we're not so going to show what this What relevance video. then would this video have in your case in chief, if any? Only in rebuttal. Right. So and, we would and, have in rebuttal and go to the and notice of, of enhancement. Yes. And those are the only basis for it. That is the crime scene, though, that's reflected in the PowerPoint. Right. That's, that's what I was trying to provide the court with some context. Is that was the original pin that was dropped on Mr. Brown's phone, was on that sidewalk where he can be seen uh, with this rifle. So, and, and that's kind of why I ask which motions am I arguing when I first stood up, because uh, these are all kind of interwoven and blended the way that Mr. Spratt has drafted them. Uh, they all I'm going to be making essentially the same argument in all of them, but I can wait and argue the uh, enhancement. I don't, want, I don't want to cut him off from making his argument. Yeah. Um, but, but going specifically to, to uh, motion number four, I've already argued that as to why it's relevant and should not be barred. The PowerPoint will have no reference to a crime or a homicide in Louisiana. It will simply show uh, the triangulation of points that Mr. Brown covered in about a 12 hour period, which is very relevant. I mean, where to, for the identification of the defendant in this case, uh, were he to say, well, I was in Louisiana all day. 
I mean, it's, it's, there's so many reasons why this is relevant. But then going to number five, we agreed already to that, that the case is extended in complex. In motion number six, the state will agree, uh, we're not calling any witnesses from the U.S. Marshal's Office or the New Orleans Police Department in our case in chief. So, so number five, essentially, we are agreeing to that. I think it specifically asked to bar the testimony of any uh, U.S. Marshal or New Orleans Police Department witness. And we're agreeing to that in our case in chief. All right. Well, let's go back. Let me hear from Mr. Spratt about number four on the PowerPoint. Uh, we had kind of skipped over that. I think we'd gone to number five. You were essentially telling me what you had thought was agreed upon. And number five, was everybody agrees on that. Number four is the PowerPoint presentation. And do you have any additional argument other than the fact that it shows he was from out of state? I, I do, Judge, because I've filed other motions in anticipation. He agreed to that. And they have no intentions of abiding by that court order. It's clear. I'm not even on any notice when we get into motion seven here in a minute. I'm on no notice, Judge, that he intended to use that as an enhancement. And now I, I, it would be my assertion that he's played that to this court to try to to try to, to wedge into the enhancement motion that I filed. That's a clear breach of a court order. And he did. They talked in their response about that, about how they, they didn't make a plea offer other than the max. Your Honor. Well, the court order says that the state shall not introduce proof of the defendant's prior bad acts regarding an alleged second degree murder in Louisiana in their case in chief and what he has just stated is he doesn't intend to introduce it in his case in chief he is he has demonstrated this video for purposes of showing why the powerpoint presentation showing that is important i have questions about you know for example how are you going to exclude evidence of the fact that the defendant was identified by louisiana authorities judge he, he said he had other identifying um he has other ways to identify that the defendant was in that vehicle. It's cumulative presentation and the danger of unfair prejudice. Now we've sent that interview out on our YouTube channel to the entire jury pool. And there was no need in that. The entire and, jury pool is not watching. If you wanted to come down and with me when I address the jury that's coming in Thursday morning, you will find that there's probably not one of them that has watched the YouTube. Uh, so I'm, trust me, I'm not as popular as you might think. <laughs> well, you are at my house, Judge. Um, well, you may watch it because it's your life. And my the kind mom. of things that we do, but not everyone else does. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. And, I, and again, that's no different than having a, an article in the newspaper, which we've dealt with for generations, and an article on television, which we've dealt with in, in substantially the same form. Um, there's no difference between that. If, per, if a, someone has watched a YouTube channel uh, and seeing something about a case, then they can be questioned about that. And that will be a necessary question for uh, jurors who are coming in. And the way we handle it will be no different than any other free trial publicity. Do you, have you read or seen anything about that, including any broadcast on the YouTube channel about this case? If you have, don't repeat what you have said. Just tell me, has that caused you to form an opinion one way or the other about the defendant's guilt? And frankly, if they've seen this video, then I would excuse them from, you know, from the jury more likely than not because I think it would be highly prejudicial. But at this point, the fact that, that it was played is not, in my opinion, anything that, that creates havoc in your case or creates any sort of problem. The question that I have is, is that why, if the state intends, and again, you can't limit the state of what they want to do unless it somehow prejudice your client. Um, your client is not from Houston County originally, is that correct? He is not, Your Honor. And, and obviously it's gonna become known at some point that he's not from Houston County. And, and, and at that point, then the fact that he's identified as leaving Louisiana coming up without any reference to any criminal activity is in my opinion, not uh, anything more than an explanation of how he ended up in Houston County. No, well, Your Honor. I don't see how it prejudices your client. Well, re respectfully, Your Honor, when the, when the agreed order was entered, I get this PowerPoint that they intended to use that in their case in chief. And now they've, they've backed off of that. So I had to file a motion. So that triggered me to file motions for the six and seven. I just don't, 
he, gen, the general said something about it being relevant to Mr. Brown's location. They can do that without backing up all the way to Louisiana. Um, and the defendant's credibility, I certainly, I would understand that if I put the defendant on the stand, which is a determination that the defendant and I would have to make. I think they're talking about the so-called confession that corroborates <clears throat> his confession. Well, I, I think the state has enough evidence if they want to, to establish his identity without doing that. And I would just ask that, there, Your Honor, the state's purpose is to try to establish judicial facts for a court in Louisiana. And that is their bigger concern in this case. That's why I, repeat that. I believe the state's purpose is to try to establish judicial facts in Tennessee that can later be used in a courtroom in Louisiana. And there is no, there's, there's no relevance to that. There's no relevance for that at all. It's cumulative presentation of evidence when they can do that other ways. He just got through telling you they're trying to link a gun to here and this and that and the other. And why? Why? He stands accused of crimes that occurred in Houston County. It can be tried. But all of this other stuff going into Louisiana, it's, it's clear that they have no intentions of abiding by the court order that they agreed to. Is this being introduced in their case in chief? Yes. Oh. The, 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 the cell phone. Oh, the PowerPoint, rep. yes. Yes. That, that is not evidence of bad acts. That, from what I'm told <clears throat> is that the PowerPoint is simply going to demonstrate his location in Louisiana and where he went from that point and ended in Houston County. And so I don't, number one, I don't see how it prejudices you, your client because of the simple fact that it's clear he's not a resident of Houston County. So he's got to come from somewhere. There's no indication if that crime scene is removed. There's no indication of where that is. It's no different than tracking someone's location, especially since there was a manhunt for the defendant. Uh, my opinion is, is that this PowerPoint presentation with the redaction of the alleged crime scene, and if there's no reference to a, a criminal investigation in Louisiana in that PowerPoint, then there's nothing that prejudices your client any more than than having an officer testify that that he later said he was from New Orleans or wherever and was found in Houston County. I, I just don't see the prejudice to you. And as as a criminal defense lawyer and my history of being that, I would like many times to try to limit the state's proof on what I'd like for them to be able to show and not show. But it only rises to the level of prejudice to your client that allows us to exclude something that is otherwise their tactics or their procedure that they want to do. I do not find as a matter of law that this PowerPoint presentation with the removal of the crime scene location, uh, that a simple PowerPoint presentation of the location of the defendant in Louisiana and tracing his movements to end up in the spot where the uh, case took place is prejudicial to a client. I find it to be relevant because of the fact that there was uh, apparently left the scene and that my understanding was a, a um, manhunt. And although there was a supposed statement whatsoever, it goes to show the identity of the defendant as being moving from that point to this point and where the crime scene occurred. Judge, briefly, I, I do believe that that may be a misunderstanding. He didn't have those cell phones after this crime allegedly occurred. Law enforcement's had those the whole time. So there, there is no, there's not going to be any evidence that shows him moving around during this uh, manhunt for with these cell phones. That there is none of that. So I don't know if that changes the court's opinion. It, it and, and I would say that it's. It, I'm sorry. It doesn't. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. So number four, we've ruled on that the PowerPoint is is admissible with a simple uh, removal of the crime scene, and there'll be no reference to criminal activity, uh, but rather it's just simply showing his movements. Uh, number <clears throat> five was agreed upon, number six, and number seven, which is what you were about to argue, I think, when General uh, Crouch, at my request, stepped up and started arguing about it. Um, and there was some indication that, that and, and what Mr. Crouch is saying is they will not call any witnesses um, to testify anyone from the U.S. Marshal's Office or from the New Orleans Police Department will not be called during the case in chief, but would only be uh, reserved for rebuttal. Um, and 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 number seven is the motion to bar testimony of Aaron Hatfield, which 
obviously is a different matter, but you want to address anything else about number six? No, Your Honor. I believe as, as stated in the email and listed on the docket notes, I think we can enter an order on six and seven. Six and seven, they're not intending to call a witness from the police department in New Orleans or from the U.S. Marshal's office in their case in chief, but are reserving the right to call them in rebuttal if necessary. They're not calling Aaron Hatfield as a witness in their case in chief, but are reserving the right to call him in rebuttal if that was necessary. Is that correct? That's correct, Judge. All right, then that's, we now have it of record. So that moves us then to number eight which is a motion to bar the state from seeking an enhanced punishment or in the alternative to continue the trial. That's correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, I don't know if the court's had a chance to familiarize uh -huh. itself with the motion. Uh, Judge, interestingly enough, in the state's response, is the court had time to review the state's response. I read that too. It was filed yesterday. And my motion my says job. that I don't take notice with the timeliness of the motion. <clears throat> That may have been misstated in my motion because I, I'm saying that the motion they filed put him on no notice at all. Simple generic terms like possession of methamphetamine, possession of, of marijuana, those don't those don't comply with the statute at all. So to this moment, I would say that the time requirement hasn't been met. So perhaps that motion was, or perhaps that that issue was misstated in my written motion. Uh, there was a document filed um, since the filing of that document. <clears throat> the state has provided me with some records just yesterday uh, from Louisiana. I only see one document in here that's signed by a judge, and that would be a, a, pl a plea form potentially of some sort to a, a domestic assault conviction. But the, the bigger the, the bigger issue I have here is that if we're ready to go to trial, I don't think they should be able to range him up based on that notice that they sent me at a sentencing hearing. And if so, I think I have to. It was incumbent upon me, or I would waive the issue to file this motion. Uh, I think State versus Benham. Um, I've had the, the defendant's criminal record. I don't know if the court's had a chance to review Benham. I've read Benham. Okay. Um, but it places an affirmative burden on the state to expressly notify the defendant of its intentions regarding sentencing. I knew of nothing about a range up until last week, and that was, I can't recall if it was General Turnbow or General Crafts that I talked to, but I knew nothing about any intention like that, of the, them to do that. And then they filed a completely defective document which is an outline that doesn't comply with the statute. And now they say, well, we've pulled a 51 year plea offer. Well, that's great judge, because they can't get 51 years out of him. We all agree on that. They're asking me to try to commit malpractice. He's entitled to be noted. He's entitled to notice of what he's facing. It, it affects trial strategy. That's what Benham says. It, it affects everything. He could change his plea. I don't know. But you can't do it now if you don't know what you're doing. So General Crouch sent me a plea offer by email, August the 30th, that was dated May the 26th. May the 17th. I get that by email on August the 30th. Now, Your Honor, as of Friday, my understanding is the state doesn't have a conviction that can even support count six of the indictment. So I don't know how in the world, I believe he has an absolute right to know what he's facing. So one, based on the general's statements to me, I'd ask that count six be dismissed. And two, either, either we go to trial and we go to trial Thursday at range one, or I want a continuance. And if I get it, and, and if, if it's a continuance, I believe ethically I had to do that. I filed one motion, one motion only in this, well, I filed a motion to change venue, a motion for a forensic evaluation, and a motion regarding New Orleans. Simple case. <clears throat> the state set on this stuff. These documents that they requested in the court, they weren't even requested until September 18th by somebody that, I just, if, if it's continued, Judge, I would ask that it be continued until March 
take into account council's professional livelihood, personal livelihood, and everything else. Because I feel like all we've done in this case is play games with New Orleans instead of try a case in Houston County. So he's not on any kind of notice. So I do think the timeliness, whether I misstated it in my motion or not, I still don't think I'm properly on notice in compliance with the statute. So whether or not that relates back to a, a Rule 12b error on their part, I would say that it does because even the notice that was shot down in Benham and the sentences returned and resentenced at range one on all counts, that was more effective than what I've got. I don't have anything. I don't have any. I have one document signed by a judge and it's a plea form. So I can't tell him what he's facing unless we go at range one or we continue. And so I would ask the court to make a ruling on that. I am prepared to go to trial Thursday, but if if the state's going to be allowed to range him up, judge, then I would object. The range goes to sentencing. It does, that Your Honor. It doesn't go to the guilt or innocence phase. It, it does, Your Honor, but, but the Benham case says that it goes directly into potentially trial strategy. Right. Like I said, had I taken one of the pleas that he offered, I'd be up there in front of the board in trouble. So, I mean, I don't think they can get what they've asked for. And I don't think it's fair for Mr. Mr. Brown could change his plea and not know what he's done. So I think he's got a right to at least be put on some sort of proper notice and simple terms that don't comply with the statute. Some of those things don't even have dates on them. I could be walking into a hornet's nest at a sentencing hearing. That's a complete denial of due process, Judge. And I'd ask if we go, and I am ready to go, if we go, I would ask that we go at range one or we continue to the court's March docket. And that I would ask, I would ask the court to, to choose one of those options or let the general choose one of those options. It, it doesn't matter to me, but I just think that one of those options needs to be the outcome of that motion. Judge, first of all, the state has never offered anything to Mr. Brown except the maximum punishment, whatever that may be. Uh, and we wouldn't know what the maximum punishment was and, until we get to the sentencing phase. Uh, the state is required to do our best job at uh, noticing the defendant that we intend to seek an enhanced range or enhanced punishment within a range. And that's what we've done. And our pleadings and filings uh, more than meet those requirements. But, but let me give the court some context. The, the initial offer of 51 years was extended, and 51 years in May of this year was the maximum punishment we calculated uh, that could be given as a sentence to the defendant, and that assumes, assumes that the court were to employ consecutive sentencing. I mean, that's up to the court. So again, we noticed him or sent an offer of 51 years. We did change that offer because in our research of Mr. Brown's prior felony convictions out of the state of Louisiana, uh, we had to compare the elements of crimes in Louisiana to the elements of crimes in Tennessee. This has actually come up in several trials in the past. When you have charges that have the same name, but they have different meanings or different um, requirements to meet those charges. And when you're trying to bring things over and compare them one for one, especially when you're doing sentencing guidelines, when you have that big chart and numbers and everything, it gets all confusing. And it's quite a bit of work to figure out whether the prior charges meet the guidelines for your charges in your state. And then one state will have assault and battery. Another state doesn't have assault. It only has battery, it only has assault. And it, they both mean the same thing and it gets super confusing. So right out of the gate, we, know, we knew that one of the prior felony convictions would not meet uh, the requirement for count four, which we had charged. So we dismissed count four already. Now, uh, Mr. Spratt is alleging that we can't meet count six, but Mr. Spr what Mr. Spratt already knows is that I am dismissing count six because the prior felonies in Louisiana are not the requisite prior felonies uh, uh, required in the elements of proving count six. So count six will be dismissed, and he already knows that. Now, 45 years is the current offer, and we went through the prior felony convictions from Louisiana, and that is our best guess at the maximum that Mr. Brown can be sentenced to. And that's assuming uh, that the court runs things consecutive, which we don't know if he will or not, if, he, if he's even convicted. 
Point being is there's been plenty of notice given uh, to the defendant. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> one, uh, if you look at our actual notice of impeachment and range of, and range of punishment, it is very detailed. Uh, some of the things that are missing are conviction dates, uh, which we have tried to amend. We literally went to Louisiana literally went traveled to louisiana and went to multiple parishes orleans parish saint james parish and saint john's parish to get certified copies of these judgments and i can put on proof through uh, investigator etheridge if the court wants their judgments are different than the judgments in tennessee they're called boykin please uh, and we can talk about the legals of that but big picture that's up to the court at the sentencing hearing to determine whether we have met our burden of, of ranging him up on each specific count. It, that's the, the defendant is asking you to essentially tell him what your decision will be at sentencing if he's convicted. With, I mean, the, the cart is way ahead of the horse on this thing, way ahead of it. Uh, we have provided Mr. Spratt with certified judgments of prior felony convictions that we obtained from the state of Louisiana. Uh, there, there is no more uh, proof that we can put on as to what we anticipate his maximum punishment can be. We've done all we can possibly do. Can I briefly respond mm -hmm. again? That, that and, and I believe, and I, if I misspoke earlier, I'm sorry, but I, I mean, I did understand that they're going to dismiss count six, but that's concerning that you didn't indict something that you didn't have the proof for. He's been sitting here and died. That was a class B felony. And now they're saying, uh oh, we don't have any proof. That concerns me. And what concerns me is looking into this, some things that there, there could be some more. Judge, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that that notice does not even come close to complying with that statute. It does not say what the nature of those convictions are. There are some that are missing dates. There are several that don't have court dates. I have some things that, that, that at one point I spoke to them last week, they thought there might be a felony marijuana charge. Well, I get that. I, it's, it's whatever that is. It, it, appear, it appears to me to be certified copies of docket minutes from the court. Not, none signed by a judge other than a plea sheet that I've seen. But last Friday, just as early as last Friday, they thought there was a felony marijuana conviction and that says clearly 14 grams or less which is not a felony here in Tennessee. So, I, I mean, I, I just feel like that, that statute was just not even close to complied with. So, I mean, we, we just asked if, if he were to, to decide, this goes deep into trial strategy and he's entitled to be put on notice of what he's facing. I realize you might not be able to change that at a sentencing hearing and they've got to get a conviction first. I understand that too, but for me to go into a trial and not be able to tell him what he's facing, that, that, that begs the question as to whether or not I'm competent to represent him. And it begs the question as to whether or not he's got post-conviction relief issues if, if there is a conviction in, when it's over with. So, I, I mean, I, I would strongly request the court to either we go at range one or we continue it. I don't think there's any other way that I can effectively represent Mr. Brown. Judge, I'll give you both sides, Mr. It's Mr. Spratt's motion, so he'll have the last say, but you certainly can address it. I just want to respond to one thing. For example, count six, based on our research and the criminal history of Mr. Brown, we, we thought we could prove that element of the crime in count six and four. Again, we met with an assistant district attorney in Louisiana to get an interpretation of their statutes. Louisiana is under the Napoleonic Code. Their, their entire legal system is different than ours. Um, so it's not surprising that there could be some differences in the uh, I say they're under the Napoleon the Code. That's the basis of all which their system is different than ours. And, and that's what I wanted the court to know. We, we didn't indict him in bad faith. Uh, it, we, we literally had to get legal advice on the interpretation of the Louisiana law. I'm not, a, I'm not uh, obviously not licensed to practice law in Louisiana. So we had a lawyer, a uh, prosecutor licensed in Louisiana to help us interpret uh, 
and, and show the equivalence to our crimes. And therefore, we dismissed count four and, and we'll be dismissing count six. Mr. Spratt? He doesn't have a lawyer in Louisiana. I'm certainly not one. So if they've had the opportunity to do that, then why shouldn't he get the opportunity to have a Louisiana lawyer or at least consult with somebody? I mean, I don't know when they had time to do that, but it, if they had time to do that, certainly they could have put me on some sort of proper notice. The question that I'm dealing with here is basically whether or not the state's notice of intent of uh, enhancement uh, complies with 4035-202 of the Tennessee Code, which is basically the section that requires <clears throat> the notice of enhancement. Let me make sure that has it. Right. And <clears throat> that section provides notice of intent to seek enhanced punishment, statement of enhancement and mitigating factors. So first part under subsection A says this, if the district attorney general believes that a defendant should be sentenced as a multiple persistent or career offender, the district attorney general shall file a statement thereof with the court and defense counsel not less than 10 days before trial or acceptance of a guilty plea, provided that notice may be waived by the defendant in writing with the consent of the district attorney general and the court accepting the plea. The statement, which shall not be made known to the jury determining the guilt or innocence of the defendant on the primary offense, must set forth the nature of the prior felony convictions, the dates of the convictions, and the identity of the courts of the convictions. The original and certified copy of the court record of any prior felony conviction bearing the same name as that by which the defendant is charged in the primary offense is prima facie evidence that the defendant named in the record is the same as the defendant before the court and is prima facie evidence of the facts set out in the record. It does not require that a certified copy of the um, convictions be attached to the notice. The notice that is set forth is only requiring three elements. One, it must set forth the nature of the prior felony conviction, the date of the conviction, and the identity of the courts for the conviction. Uh, in the Benham case that Mr. Spratt has referred to and, and relies upon, the Supreme Court in 2003 found that the uh, notice or purported notice that the district attorney's office gave uh, was insufficient because of the fact that it was not formed in a, in a separate pleading, but rather in discovery. And in the discovery, if I recall the, the statement of it, that <clears throat> the discovery said, uh, well, with the defendant's extensive, the defendant based on his overall record is a career offender. That was it. That was what the, the district attorney's office said. The state then attached to the discovery response a photostatic copy of the defendant's record of criminal offenses. The record contains the charges, the identity of the courts where the conviction occurred, and dates of disposition. Um, but it doesn't give any sort of indication as to the nature of the convictions. So, to, by statute, the district attorney general notifying a defendant of intention to seek enhanced punishment must set forth three items. This is from the Supreme Court. Nature of the conviction, the date of the conviction, identity of the courts of the conviction. Um, and that is what was there. Although the Court of Criminal Appeals stated that it appeared to contemplate the filing of a separate notice, it went on to say that that was sufficient. The Supreme Court said no. We think they have to file a separate notice, and uh, that separate notice has to be uh, formed in the, or has to be identified that it is a notice of an impeachment or range of punishment. So as opposed to the Benham case, in this case, 10 days prior to the trial, the, the state has filed a notice of impe impeachment and range of um, punishment. It was timely filed. The defendant even acknowledges that. And in it, it is styled a notice of impeachment and range of punishment. It then goes on to, to list sixteen uh, prior convictions of the defendant. Um, it does go on to give in the first. Um, the first 11 of those convictions gives the uh, nature of the offense, what it was, the uh, court or the area where it was located, and the date of the conviction or the date of, of committed. And 
those 11 comply with this court's opinion with the statement that the uh, statute provides as well as what the Supreme Court in Benham says is must be given. Number 11, I'm sorry, number 12 says he was convicted of the offense of resisting an officer in St. John the Baptist Parish, Louisiana in a case number, but it doesn't have the date. Neither does number 13, number 14, number 15, and number 16. None of those have uh, an actual date unless you count the date number, the date somehow being the case number, which this court finds is not sufficient. So this court's of the opinion that the, the 11, uh, one through 11 of those prior records on the notice of enhancement and impeachment rather and uh, range of punishment would be in fact complying with the statute and therefore would be timely filed, would be evidence that it complies with the statute. And for that reason, the defendant's motion to exclude that and the procedures arranged one is denied. He's number one, he's going to trial on Thursday. I'm not going to continue the case. We will go to trial on Thursday. Mr. Spratt has done an admirable job in getting this case ready. Uh, he is very obviously uh, impassioned in his defense of the defendant, and I expect nothing less than that. That's a very capable attorney, and the fact that, that this, he may disagree with this court's ruling, he may disagree with the state's position in the case, but it does not change the fact that he is prepared for trial. Those prior convictions are admissible under both state versus Benham and the state statute or notice of impeachment and enhancement. And as a result of that, the motion on rule uh, number eight, I guess it was, is respectfully denied. Is there anything further on this case? If we are ready for trial on Thursday. We'll begin jury selection at nine o'clock. Thank you. All rise. The circuit court of Dixon County is now in session. The Honorable Judge David will preside it. All you have visit before this court, run on and you shall be heard. God bless the United States, this state, and this court. You may be seated. All right. We are uh, ready to take up the issue of the state versus D.J. Brown. We're going to bring up Mr. Brown. All right, this is the, uh, was scheduled to be the trial date on the attempted first degree murder charge as of late yesterday afternoon, the case uh, was continued uh, by agreement with the state and the defense uh, based upon some um, information that had just been delivered, not made aware of, but I think it was uh, information that is salient to the defense that needed more time to try to resolve the issues. So we are now looking at trying to set a new trial date. Um, our next term of court is in March of 2024, and unfortunately, we have <clears throat> pretty well already filled the month of March here in Dixon County with significant trials. We have uh, the 30th and the third, the 30th and the first. I'm sorry, the 29th and the first of February. 29th of February and the first day of March. We have set criminal trials here in Dixon County. On the 4th, we have the circuit civil docket call. On the 5th of March, we start Ricky Allen Hughes attempted first degree murder. That's with Mr. Uh, Flanagan and General Allen. Then we have on the 6th, Haley Brown of the vehicular homicide case. That's your case, correct? <coughs> and that's scheduled to potentially go through the rest of the week. And on the 8th, I think is uh, General Arnold may have some additional cases. On the 11th, 12th, we have a criminal docket call. The 13th, we have State versus Pollard, which is a uh, rape trial. Is that uh, Ms. Smith's case, if I understand it correctly, that we had motions on? And it's been continued a number of times, so it's going to have to go. And then Friday the 15th is the DUI day, if I recall correctly. 
18th is Chancery Day, then the 19th through the 21st is supposed to be the Judicial Conference in Murfreesboro. I'm not really supposed to say where it's supposed to be, but in any event. We'll be there. Thanks for the invitation, Judge. Um, 22nd is the uh, Howard Hogan drug case. Then we go to the 25th and we have criminal trials, Robert Capes and uh, some others that are set behind it. And then we have VOP day on the 26th, 27th, 28th is Chantry, 29th is Good Friday, and that is it. Uh, we have filled up a lot of the month of April that would normally be in Humphreys County with criminal trials here in Dixon. The circuit civil docket call on the first day of Humphreys County, the uh, first day of April is a Humphreys County circuit civil docket call, <clears throat> and then I have a will contest set on uh, the second here in Dixon County, and then we have Chancery on the third and fourth and fifth in different counties. Then I have a criminal docket in Waverly on the eighth, and we start the ninth through the twelfth uh, criminal trials in Waverly. And then we have Paul Garrett on starting here in Dixon on the 15th, and backing that up starting on the 18th and 19th is the State versus Travierso, which is a second degree murder case that was continued from Tuesday of next week. And then we have criminal trials in Dixon again on the 22nd and 23rd. Then I have Humphreys County violation of probation on the 24th. Then I have the 25th and 26th as Chancery and the 29th and the 30th, we said again, uh, criminal trials and that one is Watson Thomas and aggravated rape case. So, anybody have any suggestions? Yeah. Your Honor, as the court is aware, this, this case originated in Houston County. The venue has been transferred to Dixon County, but I think it would be appropriate to use a Houston County a trial date for this case. I, I know the folks in Houston County, uh, the prosecutor and the sheriff and uh, all would be happy to uh, move some of their criminal cases and, and let this case take its place. Well, I have December the 12th through the 14th as criminal trial dates in um, Houston County. Yeah. And, and the state would uh, be ready to go uh, by December the 12th. There's a, there's a logic to that, Mr. Spratt. There is, Your Honor, other than I have, and I'm not sure the exact amount, but I believe I have 10 cases set for trial with Judge Wallace in December. Uh, some of those are very serious. Some of them, those have age on them that I, I need to, I need to address those. So, I mean, December's... <clears throat> There's what um, a rape trial that's set on a retained client that's about six years old, maybe seven. When then is that set? It's set December seven, I believe. I'm sorry. Set right now, December eighth. Uh, I have. Sentence and hearings set in Houston County. I have trials set the following week in December in Humphreys County. I have an aggravated sexual battery set on December the 12th in Humphreys County. And who is the judge in Humphreys County? It will be Judge Wallace in December. I think I can help you with that situation. Um, <clears throat> this case, in my opinion, would take precedence over any of your other cases and if I can uh, we'll take a break and I'll contact Judge Wallace and see if there's any problem with with that. Um, I do think it is important to try to get this case heard and, and decided and I don't mind giving a, the continuance yesterday as we discussed for the basis for it. Uh, Yes, Stewart County is doc your your bailiwick. Uh, what are we looking like for trials in in Stewart County in the month of November, starting through <clears throat> say the 14th through the 17th? I'm sure we got our trial dates. It is, Your Honor. Let me pull up the trial schedule right quick. I 
mean, we, we do have some cases that are a little older, Judge, that need to be tried, but no one that I'm seeing is incarcerated. Right. We have some cases that are a little older that need to be tried, but I'm not seeing anyone who's incarcerated on older cases, so. All right, well, let me see the counsel in the jury room across the hall. I'd like to bring your calendar and let's see what we can figure out. So. All right. Well, I thought there's a head down there, and, it's, and I know it's not, uh, I didn't think it was Pam Billingsley, but I thought she was on the screen here, so I wanted to know whose head I was looking at. <laughs> Come in to do that, so oh, I wouldn't have to run around. That's good. <laughs> Just say like the very tip top of my head. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, after a thorough conference with the uh, lawyers involved in this case, we are going to, instead of trying to move this case to March, we're going to expedite it and move it to January the 23rd through the 26th will now be the new trial date. It will be here in Dixon County in this courtroom. <clears throat> in addition to that, we are now setting some additional motion days. A status day or a motion day will be on the 9th of November here in this courtroom. That will be after the Paul Garrett uh, rape motions on the 8th. <clears throat> we also have a sentencing hearing on State versus Tomlin that day. Uh, we'll be, uh, Mr. Brown's motions will be heard on the um, night at nine o'clock. We're going to have Mr. Brown transported on the eighth uh, so that he can be here and meet with his lawyer in advance of those motions and uh, have him here on the eighth and ninth for those motions. In addition, then <clears throat> in the month of December, when I would normally, this is a Houston, originated in Houston County and my Houston County docket is going to be on the 11th. So at 1.30, I have a status on the state versus Stephen Wiggins regarding the motion for new trial. We're going to set a status day in this case for the 11th of December. All of this, Mr. Brown, for your information, is designed to try to expedite and make sure that everything that needs to be done in your case to get ready for your trial in January is being done and that there aren't any glitches like we've had this time, okay? So all we're trying to do is to make sure that we keep it on track and that there's no, it will not be continued in, from that January trial day. So we'll, we're going to trial on the 23rd of January. Um, with that being the case, and so we have three new dates, the 9th of, these, of November, oh, and I'm sorry, we're gonna need to transport him, <clears throat> I believe we said on the 8th of, was it the 8th of December and have him held through the 11th and then on the trial, we're going to need to have him transported um, from the Department of Corrections on the 18th and then hold him through the trial at that point. And we're going to do an order uh, for the uh, Captain Davis. We're going to do an order that will reflect all of those days we need him transported. But that's all in, in an effort to expedite and assist Mr. Spratt in trying to communicate with Mr. Brown and make sure that everything's being done accordingly. Anything else then that, with that having been announced on the record? Just briefly, just briefly, the motions from Tuesday, the orders for those, uh, do those need to be, I guess since I've stood up and raised the issue, I'm kind of volunteering that I'm gonna to have to drop those. I didn't well, <clears throat> I know you've got a full plate with some other things. Uh, is there any reason that those motions couldn't be done by the state or the order on those motions couldn't be done by the state? Mr. We'll be happy to draft orders on Mr. Spratt's motions. <laughs> Well, if they're your motions, then that, then logically they would be uh, an order that you would need to draw. So. We, we can do them, Judge. Uh, well, you two talk. I don't care who does it. I just want to do it. I just, private, being in private practice by himself, or with, even if he's in Baker Law Group, it, it is a situation where he doesn't quite have the same um, advantages that perhaps your office has. So y'all talk about it. I don't care who does it. I just want to make sure they get done. I do think a written order reflecting that ruling is, is clear for the record and it, it's an advantage. Then is there anything else with this case then before we adjourn? Pardon? The December 11th date, when do you want him transported? Oh, the December date, we need him transported on the 8th to have him housed here in, uh, is that correct, the 8th? Yes. Uh, 8th of December will be the day we need him transported here so that Mr. Spratt can talk to him that afternoon. 
and be in, be ready for the hearing on the 11th. And then he'll be transported from the Dixon County Jail to the Houston County Courthouse where that hearing will take place at 1.30 on the 11th. All right. Anything else? It's all from defense, Judge. All right, then we'll hopefully, uh, everything will be now in place to carry this on through and have it tried in January and we'll be adjourned for the day. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have, have all right. All right, we're here on the uh, state of Tennessee versus B.J. Brown, um, attempted first degree murder and other assor assorted charges. This, uh, we're about to begin the jury selection, but I wanted to address one issue that was brought to my attention yesterday. <clears throat> Mr. Brown, I am told that you had advised Mr. Spratt, your court appointed attorney, that you had desired to uh, hire, a, to discharge him and hire your own lawyer, if I understood correctly. That's why I'm at in room of men. Pardon? The, the facility I'm in. The facility I'm in, I only get one thirty minutes of call a month. So, like, I just got to make one phone call every 30 minutes. But when I left in December, that's when I talked to my people because I had time to talk to the phone. And that's when they decided to say that they're going to give me an attorney. But I've been trying to get an attorney. But I only get one phone call a month, 30 minutes. Well, this case has been pending now for over a year. And, I know. and it was reset the last time from its trial date <clears throat> to allow Mr. Spratt to have some additional time to, uh, to prepare. In addition to that, it was uh, set in December on a status to make sure that we had um, everything in order so that we could proceed on the trial. And based on the fact that you, you've had an attorney that's a competent attorney that is experienced in criminal matters and that was appointed by the court, uh, and in my opinion, there's not a basis now the day before trial to continue the trial in order to allow you to hire a different attorney. You've had plenty of opportunity to do so and understand the limitations, but people hire attorneys from jail on a regular basis. I just oh, don't. I'm at in River Bend, I only get one 30 minutes call a month. So when I use the phone, I talk to my people and I try to get in touch with my, my stepmom and my daddy and all of them all on three way. And then when they say they're going to get the attorney, I don't, I can't make a phone call to the next month. So when I talk to them in December, it was my time for my 30 minutes again. I talked to him when I left and I had like 12 to 13 minutes to talk to him when I went back after I left court in December the 11th. And I didn't wouldn't have, a, wouldn't have, uh, have another 30 minutes to talk to him until January the 11th. And well, <clears> the Constitution uh, allows you to have an attorney and make sure that you are represented by competent counsel. We provided that for you. If you had chosen to hire a different lawyer, then the case has been pending in this court's opinion long enough to allow you that opportunity or your family that opportunity. And I'm not going to continue it again to allow that uh, you to change attorneys at this late date. So if you have a seat, we're going to begin the jury selection. So we've, we've considered your request on the record and I'm denying it. And obviously that becomes an issue on appeal if necessary. So. All right. The rule requested by either party. It is, Your Honor. Rule has been requested. That means that any witness who's going to testify, other than that uh, designated law enforcement officer that the state has, must go outside of the courtroom and remain outside of the courtroom until you're called to testify. You are not to discuss the testimony of any other witness with anyone pending your own testimony. Is the monitor out in the lobby area off? Council are under continuing duty to ensure that the rule is complied with. <laughs> now you can sit anywhere you want, so you can experiment and try a new chair if you want to. So. <clears throat> I think we have everyone back. So, ladies and gentlemen, right when I um, adjourn for lunch after reading you the initial instructions, the next step will be the reading to you of the indictment. Uh, you know, Crouch. The grand jurors of Houston County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oaths do present that on or about June 27th, 
2022 in Houston County, Tennessee, and prior to the finding of this indictment, uh, the defendant, B.J. Brown, then and there, unlawfully, knowingly, deliberately, and feloniously, with premeditation, attempted to kill Officer Daryl Tiber. While acting in his capacity as a law enforcement officer, as defined in TCA 3913202, all of which is against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count two and the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do present and say that on or about June 27th of 2022 and prior to the finding of this indictment in the county and state aforesaid, the said B.J. Brown then and there unlawfully and feloniously possessed a firearm to wit a Smith & Wesson M&P 15 caliber 223 and 5.56 with the intent to go armed during the commission of a dangerous felony to wit attempted first degree murder. Count three, and the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present and say that on or about June 27th, 2022, and prior to the finding of this indictment, in the county and state aforesaid, the said B.J. Brown then and there unlawfully and feloniously employed a firearm to wit a Smith & Wesson M&P 15 caliber 223 and 5.56 during the flight from a dangerous felony to wit attempted first degree murder of Officer Daryl Tiber. Count four, the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present and say that on or about June 27th, 2022, and prior to the finding of this indictment, in the county and state aforesaid, said B.J. Brown did unlawfully and feloniously possess a firearm in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated 3917-1307, <clears throat> excuse me, all of which is against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count five, uh, the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present and say that on or about June 27th, 2022, and prior to the finding of this indictment, <clears throat> in the county and state aforesaid, the said B.J. Brown then and there did unlawfully and knowingly possess a firearm in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated 3917-1307, all of which is against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Through that indictment, how does the defendant plead? Hey, Your Honor, we need to take up a matter outside the presence of the jury before we right, Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll step up. <clears throat> the the indictment alleges that Mr. Brown acted unlawful in count one says then and there acted unlawfully, knowingly, deliberately, feloniously, and with premeditation. <clears throat> the first degree murder statute requires that a, a premeditated and intentional killing of another. So I, I think the indictment has imputed an incorrect mens rea to the charge if it's first degree murder. If it's charged as attempted second degree murder, I think that's fine, but I don't I don't think that that the jury can find him guilty by knowing mens rea when the requisite mens rea for first degree murder it, <clears throat> at, at least is what we think they're traveling under is a, a premeditated and intentional killing of another. So we'd ask that the that count one that the jury can only be instructed as to attempted second degree murder. Well, the indictment clearly states is charging the defendant with an attempted premeditated murder. Any other language outside of that can be argued, but is superfluous to what we're doing here. He's charged with the correct premeditated murder statute 3913202 and clearly states he did these actions with premeditation. <clears throat> well, the court is uh, of the opinion that that is an issue that will rest before the jury retires to deliberate, but I'll have to make that ruling on your motion at that point in time. But the state has the right to put on their proof. The indictment, uh, as it presently states, uh, does charge him with attempted first degree murder and it, and it makes reference to the statute, uh, first degree murder statute, as well as to the uh, attempted statute so it seems to me that those both put the defendant on notice of what they're attempting to prove and whether or not that will allow the jury to consider the first degree attempted first degree will be an issue i'll have to resolve before the jury begins to deliberate so i understand now briefly just just briefly for the record that we had a, a flaw that was cleared where the podium we're, rec we're recording everything that's being said. Mr. I'm sorry. Sorry. So, <clears throat> just briefly, um, I mean, we had the inverse problem where we were directed to an incorrect statute. So, I mean, the, and also 
just while I'm bringing it up in order to bring every bit of this up, <clears throat> the indictment never says that he did attempt to kill. So it doesn't allege that he says what? It doesn't say, it says feloniously in, with premeditation. It doesn't say that he did attempt, doesn't say that he did anything. It doesn't allege that Mr. Brown made an act in that count. And so we've had the inverse problem where we were directed to the wrong statute and now we're supposed to be directed to the right statute. You're saying he did, it, the indictment count one doesn't say he did anything? It doesn't does say it, he did. It doesn't do it. Lawfully, a lawfully, knowingly, deliberately, feloniously, and with premeditation attempt to kill Officer Darrell Tabor? It doesn't say he did attempt to kill. I'm just pointing out language in the indictment because I've combed the indictment since we've amended it. So the omission of a word did is what you're saying? Yes, and I don't know. It, it, yes, sir. That's it. I think that was going to be easy for me to rule on. I'm, I don't see that that creates a problem, but the question of whether or not the language is sufficient to allow the jury to consider an attempted first degree murder case, I will review and give you a ruling before they retire to deliberate. So, Thank you, Judge. Anything else before we bring the jury in? Now let's bring the jury in, please. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, on June the 27th of 2022, uh, the defendant uh, drove from New Orleans, Louisiana, leaving there at a.m., approximately 9 a.m., uh, to Houston County, Tennessee. Uh, when he was driving through Aaron, which is a town in Houston County, uh, Officer Tabor conducted a traffic stop, or attempted to conduct a traffic stop off of Highway 149 in Houston County. This was about 9 o'clock p.m. The officer turned on his blue lights to initiate the traffic stop, and the defendant turned off of Highway 149 into a McCaskill's construction company in excavating. Now, this company has a fairly large driveway with a building site and a fence around uh, the back portion of the uh, construction company. The defendant pulled his car to uh, the edge of the fence. Uh, officer Tabor was sitting in his car with the blue lights flashing in uniform. And the defendant opened the door of his vehicle and got out and was instructed by Officer Tabor to get back in his car. He, you will be able to hear and see this on video. Officer Tabor remained inside of his vehicle giving him this command and the defendant does briefly enter back into his car and then comes back out with an AR-15 style rifle. Uh, he then proceeds to fire 14 rounds uh, at Officer Tabor as he is sitting in his patrol car. Uh, you will see this on video. You will hear the officer testify. You will see his injuries. He was shot two times. In the course of this uh, incident, Officer Tabor was able to return fire from with inside his patrol vehicle. Uh, he fired from his 9 millimeter pistol, his duty weapon. Uh, the defendant was not struck. Uh, you will see on video from McCaskill's construction, the defendant uh, runs into the wood line uh, around the fence. And from there, a two day manhunt begins looking for the defendant. Uh, again, you will see video from the, from the body camera of the officer and uh, surveillance equipment that was mounted to the exterior building at McCaskill's construction. So you're going to have two different views uh, of this attempted murder. You will also hear the confession of the defendant when he is interviewed by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. You're going to hear from a ballistics expert at the TBI who did a comparison of the shell casings that were recovered at the crime scene, 14 shell casings that were matched to the rifle that the defendant had in his possession. Uh, this rifle was recovered from a creek that the defendant crossed as he was trying to elude law enforcement. You're going to hear from several other witnesses, uh, but at the end of this trial, the state will come back to you after all the evidence has been presented and ask that you con convict the defendant uh, on all five charges. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, we've had a long morning. We're up. The state's going to put on proof, and you will hear from Mr. Uh, Brown as far as what as far as what happened that night and we're confident 
that when you hear the proof and you weigh the law, that you'll find Mr. Brown not guilty of the charges that he's charged with. Thank you. State may call your first witness. Sure. Would you state and spell your first and last name for the jury, please? First name is Daryl, D-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Last name is Tiber, T-I-E-B-O-R. How are you employed? I am an officer with the City of Erin Police. How long have you been doing that? How long have you been in law enforcement? I've been an officer for just over two years. All right. Um, what are your duties at the Erin Police Department? Uh, I'm a patrol officer. Um, basically, uh, patrol all the streets, uh, traffic stops, uh, general investigations. All right. On June 27th of last year, were you on shift? Or excuse me, of actually 2022, we just got in the new year. That is correct. All right. And did you come into con, or did you make a traffic stop of a burgundy vehicle that, that night? That is correct. You recall about what time? It was around just after 9 p.m. Well, so it was dark outside. That is correct. All right. So if you will, tell us your, what drew your attention to that vehicle and kind of go from there. I witnessed a vehicle uh, traveling northbound on Highway 13 South. That vehicle stopped at a four-way stop sign and then turned turned westbound onto Highway One or Highway 49. As that vehicle was approaching me, I was sitting stationary by local business facing Highway 49. I noticed the vehicle, as it was coming up to me, made a it hit the brakes pretty hard, and uh, so it drawed my attention. Uh, as the vehicle passed me, I could see that there was no license plate on the back of the vehicle and could not see any temp tag in the rear window as well. All right, and you said you were sitting stationary. That's correct. All right, so were you just observing traffic that evening? That's correct. All right, and, and how were you positioned in relation to the road that you saw this vehicle on? Um, just parallel to the road. Right. Okay, so just off the, off the shoulder of the road? Just off the, just off to the shoulder. All right. So your, was your car facing the road in front of you? That is correct. All right. And did you pull pull out on this vehicle? That is correct. After it passed by me, I could not see a license plate or any temp tag. I pulled out behind the vehicle. All right. And then what happened? A uh, vehicle was turning on to Highway 149 northbound and caught up to the vehicle, activated my emergency traffic control equipment, and conducted a traffic stop. So were you in a marked patrol unit? That, that is correct. And um, visible lights. <laughs> All right. uh, you met, and I should ask you, this was in Houston County. Uh, City of Erin in Houston County. All right. Um, so you turn. You said you made a traffic stop. Does that mean you turn your lights on? That's correct, sir. Right. And what did the vehicle do when you turned your lights on? When I activated my emergency traffic traffic control equipment, the vehicle exited the roadway and pulled up to a local business, McCaskill's Construction. Uh, the vehicle pulled up into a parking spot up to the building. Right. Did you find that to be odd? That is correct. Usually when people, you make a traffic stop, people pull over to the shoulder of the road. They don't exit the roadway entirely and pull straight up to a building. So he had, or, or, you described for me, you said that he pulled up to a building. So was his car at that point perpendicular to the road? No, sir. It was not perpendicular to the road. It uh, pulled straight up into the parking lot, uh, parking space of the building. The uh, front end of the vehicle was facing the building. All right. And then what happened? As I was uh, giving uh, dispatch, central dispatch, a uh, description of the vehicle as there was no tag to read out, um, individual exited the vehicle and began uh, faced me and started uh, saying what did I do officer tell me what I did uh, I gave commands for the vehicle or for the individual to return to his vehicle and sit down and wait for me um, the individual sat back down inside of his vehicle uh, at that time I picked back up my radio to notify dispatch and give them a better description of the vehicle at that time individual exited his vehicle i noticed in his hands what appeared to be an ar-15 uh, i heard two shots uh, ring out and at that time i 
drop my radio and grab my service rep weapon and return fire through the windshield. And did the R-15 continue firing as you were firing? That is correct. And let's, let me back up just a little bit. When you make a traffic stop, once you have a car pulled over, what, what are you doing at that point as an officer? Uh, like what, what tasks are you doing immediately? As we're conducting a traffic stop, we're giving information to dispatch uh, as far as uh, license plate, uh, any description we can of the vehicle. And do you do that over a handheld radio? Uh, there is a car radio. Okay. And that's what you were engaged in when all of this happened that you've spoken about? That is correct. All right. Um, so did could you give a description of the individual, or did you see the individual very well that, that got out of the vehicle? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, give, uh, us, give us a brief, brief, brief description of him, please. Appeared to be an African-American individual, about 5'7". Um, I remember him wearing a, a white T-shirt with a blue baseball cap. All right. Um, so you said you heard two shots and then you pulled your service weapon and returned fire. That's correct. Um, after you heard those two shots, how did you feel? I felt like I was about to die. And when you pulled your service weapon, did you even have a chance to get out of your vehicle? At that point, um, that was the last thing on my mind. Um, the individual was shooting at me and I needed to protect my life. So did you shoot from through the windshield from, from inside your vehicle? That is correct. I was seated inside of my driver's side, or the driver's side of my patrol car. Uh, I had one foot that was out of the doorway, um, returned fire through the windshield. And were you in a, a full uniform as you are today? Uh, I was in a short sleeve class A. And is that a like a, a marked uniform? That's correct. Just right. same as this uniform, just short sleeve. Okay. Um, at any point during this exchange, prior to you hearing the gunshots, did you have your service weapon drawn? No, sir. So before you heard gunshots, your service weapon remained in its holster? That's correct. All right. And you were shooting a nine millimeter uh, uh, pistol? That's correct. All right. Um, and, and prior to this, it may sound like a silly question, um, prior to this exchange, were there any bullet holes or any damage to your vehicle that you're aware of? No, sir. Right. And if a spent 223 round was found in your vehicle, was that there prior to this to your knowledge? It would have to be after, sir. All right. Um, and the only weapon you fired was nine millimeter? That's correct. Did you have a, uh, a car camera, a dash cam uh, at this time? I did. All right. And have you had a chance to review to see if that footage was being captured? I have, sir. All right. I'd like to play that at this point, Your Honor. <clears throat> Thank you. 
And there's no sound on the, the car's dash cam, is that right? The dash cam that I had at that time does not have sound. Um, and the way that car was pulled down in there, is that what you were describing first as being odd? That's correct, sir. And was that a chain link fence in front of it? Yes. And then the building you described, was that off to the right a little bit? Just off to the right. Okay. You're going to ask to make a copy of that dash cam first exhibit. All right, we'll mark it as exhibit one. <clears throat> Officer Tiber, as um, this person was shooting, what, what were they doing as they were shooting? As they began shooting, um, and I returned fire, that individual began moving to my left, his right, and um, I believe he at one point started hopping as he was shooting. All right. Um, and after he goes off the screen that we can see here, after he gets out of there, did he continue to go to his left, your right, or the other way around, his right, your left? That's correct. All right. And did you ever see him again that night? I did not. What did you do um, after you returned fire there? As soon as I returned fire and the individual uh, had run off at that point, I did exit my patrol car and reloaded my service weapon uh, as I was unsure of how many rounds I had initially fired and moved to a position of... Uh, cover and concealment behind my vehicle. I was unsure if there was any more people inside of the vehicle that meant to harm me or if the individual would try to flank around the other side of the building and try to fire at me again. And with the tint of the windows on the vehicle, could you see inside of it at all? N not at that moment. So you couldn't see anything that was going on in there? No, sir. All right. And did backup eventually arrive? I believe it was four and a half minutes later while I was behind uh, my patrol vehicle. Um, I believe it was four and a half minutes for county deputies to arrive. Okay. And were you also wearing a body-worn camera uh, during this incident? That's correct. All right. And have you reviewed it to see if it captured the footage of the incident? Yes, sir. All right, Your Honor, I'd like to play that at this time. Sit down in your car, sir. One oh six central. Uh car did One of six shots fired. Shots fired. McCaskills. Matt McCaskills. Ten four for the moment. I've been shot. Yeah, 
Is the suspect still around? He fled on foot around the back side of McCaskill's. Officer Teeter, from that moment, was it a couple more minutes uh, before a deputy could get to you to provide aid? That's correct. All right. And did you have any idea at that point what the defendant was doing, what was going on? No idea, sir. All right. Has to make a copy of that video the next exhibit. Your mark is exhibit two. <clears throat> Officer Teeter, we, we hear you in that video say that you've been hit. Were you, in fact, shot? That's correct. How many times were you shot? Twice. All right. have a, I'm going to hand you a picture here, and if you could identify this picture. What, but, what does that picture depict? Uh, it's a picture of me. Depict, uh shows a wound in my upper left arm of a gunshot. Is that the same picture that we see right there on the screen? That's correct. All right. And is your arm there at the upper left part, is that where you were hit one of the times? That's correct. All right. Um, where did the other round go? In my left elbow. All right. And is it in fact still in your arm today? That's correct. Still have a bullet inside of my arm. Um, make that exhibit the next, or that photo the next exhibit. Please. Exhibit three. I hand you another photo here. Can you identify that photograph? Yes, sir. What is that? Is it the same photograph we see there on the screen? That is correct. And uh, describe that photograph for us. Uh, photograph over the my left shoulder from the backside, depicting the exit wound from the bullet that had entered my upper left arm. And is that the exit wound uh, on your your upper left shoulder up here? That is correct. Here. Yes, sir. What other injuries did you sustain uh, with being shot? Just uh, cut, minor cuts and scrapes from glass. Do you have any broken bones? Um, my clavicle was fractured from the, the round that entered my upper left arm. All right. Has to make that photograph the next exhibit, please, Your Honor. Mark is exhibit four. Officer Tiber, um, the, the the person that shot you, do you see him in the courtroom? Today? That is correct. Could you point to him, please, sir? Your Honor, for the record, Officer Tiber's identified the defendant. Further, Scratch him and cross examine. <clears throat> Afternoon, Officer Tiber. <clears throat> so, Can you go through, through that with me again? Where were you um, when Mr. Brown passed you that again? I was when you right were stationary. The, I mean, I was stationary by the intersection of Highway 49 and Highway 149 at Computer One. Is that an area commonly known as the crossroads over in? It's just right around by the crossroads, sir. And when you. Did you pull out and follow him for a minute before you activated your blue lights? Uh, just to catch up to the vehicle. Uh, the speed limit is 55 on Highway 149. And I believe uh, I got up to 43 miles an hour or 53 miles an hour um, before I activated my emergency traffic control equipment. And that was because you didn't see a regular tag on the vehicle? I did not. Okay. At what point was there a temp tag on the vehicle? Um, after after all this has occurred, seeing photographs afterwards, there is indeed a temp tag in the rear of the vehicle, which I did not see at the time of the stop. Okay. And <clears throat> so, 149. You you said that that went north. Did that did that that veers up 149 towards Clarksville? That's correct. At least toward Clarksville. And it, 
can you remember if you can was was that when you activated your equipments on 149 that is correct and how far up 149 did you go before mr before that vehicle pulled over not even an eighth of a mile an eighth of a mile okay and when he pulls in how far is that driveway to mccaskill's like how long is it i estimate probably about probably about 20 yards about 20 yards okay. so so i mean that wouldn't be entirely uncommon to pull off right there would it i mean I've, would it be more uncommon if it was 50 yards 75 100 as i stated earlier most vehicles when you perform a traffic stop they stay perpendicular to the roadway and they don't pull into a business with the front of their vehicle pointed toward the business okay. <clears throat> and the individual um, shooting in that video he immediately starts running to his right as the individual began shooting and I returned fire at that time that's when he started going to my left and his right so but took off to his right that's correct and how far did you say did you say that the individual uh, entered the wood line at some point I never said that sir I don't know I lost sight of him as it was dark outside and he ran around the back side of the chain link fence how far is it from where you were parked or, or where that that vehicle was parked how far is that from the end of that chain link fence the wood line sir yes we're, yeah more or less I don't have an idea sir and I've never measured it yes I'd say probably 50 yards okay. 50 yards <clears throat> let me ask you this do you, do you know when you were struck with the bullet I do sir when did that happen as I was returning fire at the individual okay. were you still in your patrol I was still vehicle? seated inside of my patrol car all right, and from the moment on that video to you told him to get back and get or you told the individual to get back in your car, right? That's correct. I gave him commands to return to his car. And then the shooting started pretty quickly after that. Like That's that. correct. Okay. So from the time that you observed the vehicle till the time that the vehicle pulled into McCaskill's and shots were fired. How long do you think that was? Maybe 20 seconds. Maybe 20 seconds. And you don't, you don't, you don't know Mr. Brown, do you? No, sir. I don't. You'd never seen that vehicle before that night, had you? Never in my life. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you. Redirect. Speak to Judge. So, Officer Tabor, parallel perpendicular kind of confuses me sometimes. Is it typical for a vehicle when they pull off to pull off to the side of the road with their driver wheels next to the white line, the front and back wheels? That is correct. That's very characteristic, uh, very normal for the average person to pull over and still face the same way as they were traveling down the roadway. And is that why you found it odd that the vehicle pulled in and all the way up to that fence? That is correct. All right. And then we don't have to wonder how long this whole thing took because we have the whole thing on video, don't we? That's correct. All right, Your Honor, I'm going to ask to play uh, Exhibit 1 again so we can see the full length. All right. All right Officer Teaver, um, we see on your dash cam here, it says 2002. Is that the, the time? I believe that the time was an hour off. Okay time change or something of that nature at that point yes but does, does that keep time as far as events and, and and keep track of the time as we go on the video that's correct all right so we're, we're at 200208 right now
And right there, shooting's happening. Is that correct, Officer Tabor? That is correct. And now we're at 20.03.26. So we're almost a full minute and a half later. Is that right? If we started at 20.02.08? That's correct. All right. And then immediately after th this, is that when Mr. Brown <coughs> runs to the other end of the chain link fence? That's correct. As uh -huh. he's shooting and moving to his right side and hopping, he, after he finished that, he ran around the right side of the fence. That's on my question, Judge. Now, Officer Tabor, I didn't mean to put you on the spot about that. I didn't remember the time myself, so I'm actually glad that. But so it was a full minute and a half from the time you pulled out, just just a minute and a half from then to when that happened. Correct. Based on the video. Yes, sir. Okay. Further Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We state your full name for the record, please. My full name is Alex Broadhag. And we spell your first and last name. The first name is Alex, A L E X. The last name is Broadhag, spelled B R O D H A G. And Agent Broadhag, where are you employed? I'm employed by the state of Tennessee. I work for the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation in their crime lab down in Nashville. Okay. And do you have an area of expertise at the crime lab? Yes, sir, I do. I'm a firearms examiner. How long have you been a firearms examiner with the TBI? I've been a firearms examiner about 20 years. And how does one become a certified firearms examiner? You want me to talk about my education? Yes, please. Or? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Forensic Chemistry from Ohio University. I have a couple of internships, one with the Analytical Toxicology Laboratory at the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and then another with the Columbus, Ohio Police Crime Laboratory. I began my career with a TBI uh, back in 1998. Initially, I was a drug chemist, and then in 2002, I had, I had an opportunity to transfer into the firearms examination section. At that time, I underwent two years of on-the-job training. And during that two-year period, I worked under the supervision and guidance of a firearms examiner who had over 20 years of experience at that time. As part of my training, I spent hundreds of hours looking through the comparison microscope at fired bullets and cartridge cases. And this training enabled me to recognize those markings with which I could pair up a fired bullet or a fired cartridge case to a particular firearm. Uh, in addition to that, I received a training from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives with their National Firearms Examiner Academy. This was a year-long uh, training program in firearms examination that ran concurrently with the two years of training I received from the TBI. I've also received training from the Federal Bureau of Investigation out at their academy in Quantico, Virginia. And again, that's in firearms examination. Thank you. And Agent, can you identify this document, please? Yes, sir, this is my CV. And is that a correct and accurate copy of your CV? Yes, it is. All right, I'll move the CV of Agent Broadhag as exhibit number five, please. Exhibit five. And Agent, how many times have you been qualified as an expert in firearms examination in the courts of Tennessee? Over 100 times. Your Honor, this time I would tender Agent Broadhag as an expert in firearms examination. Mr. Brad, do you have any voir dire you wish to make? No voir dire, Your Honor. You'll be qualified as an expert witness in the field of firearms examination. Thank you. Agent Broadhag, in this particular case, which occurred in June of 2022, were you asked to perform some examinations? Yes, sir, I was. You, you... You examined uh, several items in this case, is that right? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, one of which uh, includes a patrol vehicle. Yes, that's right. And today I want to be I want to discuss and ask questions about two of your lab reports that you've issued. Uh, one that is dated from all, the date issued was August the fifteenth of uh, twenty twenty two, and the other is October twenty seventh of twenty twenty two. Do you have copies of those labs? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm also going to be directing your attention to some photographs that will be displayed on the screen. Go to the next photo. 
Hey, Jean. <clears throat> Can you identify this photograph? This is a photograph of the vehicle, the patrol vehicle that I examined. Um, I was asked to do a trajectory determination, and that's a, a estimation of the flight path of the bullets when they entered the vehicle based on the damage to the vehicle. So these photographs are um, of the vehicle after I've inserted the trajectory rods into the uh, damaged areas in the vehicle. Thank you. And is the photograph that you're holding the same photograph that we see displayed on the screen? Yes, it is. And Agent, is that actually a combination of two photographs uh, just from different directions? That's right. And again, I'm going to be asking you some questions referring to your lab report. So if you need to look at it, that's fine. And these questions will be based on the lab report issued on August 15th of 2022. Uh, first, uh, looking at the photograph, what, what are the numberings? The numbers indicate the individual bullet defects. Some of them are holes, some of them are glancing marks on the surface of the automotive bodywork. But each one of those numbers des designates a specific area of damage on the vehicle. Okay. In the photograph that's on the, on the screen now, uh, we can see numbers uh, one through nine. Is that correct? Yes, one through nine. And can you describe uh, the defects in the vehicle beginning with holes number one and two? Defects one and two are holes which perforate the lower front bumper on, on the driver's side. The direction of travel is, you want me to give the results of my- Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The direction of travel is from the front of the vehicle and toward the back. And I don't have any additional information on the trajectory because of the lack of a secondary impact point on the first two defects, apart from it being front to back. Okay. And when you say front to back, you actually have these trajectory rods inserted showing the direction of travel of uh, these bullets? That's right. It's from the front of the car towards the back of the car. Right. And would you describe the defect in hole number three? Three is a hole which perforates the upper bumper on the driver's side. A bullet which made this hole pass through the front bumper and entered the engine compartment. It then collided with a vertical uh, coolant hose. The direction of travel is front to back, slightly driver's side to passenger side, slightly downward. And Agent, there's also a note about collecting some bullet fragments from uh, this hole, is that correct? Yes, it's uh, routine when I examine a vehicle, I'm gonna open the hood and uh, I found some bullet fragments underneath the hood. Okay. And <clears throat> defect number four or hole four, can you describe that? Yes, defect four is a hole which perforates the headlight on the driver's side. The bullet would made, which made this hole passed through the headlight and entered the driver's side front wheel well. It then collided with the suspension strut spring and strut liner. The direction of travel is front to back, driver's side to passenger side, and slightly downward. Thank you. And defect five. Defect five is an elliptical shaped hole which perforates the upper driver's side front fender. The bullet which made this hole passed through the fender and then collided with the interior surfaces underneath. The direction of travel is front to back. And additional information on the trajectory cannot be determined because of the a lack of a usable secondary impact point. When I insert trajectory rods, I need two holes ideally um, in order to get a correct path of the bullet. So in this case, I had uh, damage on the surface, but not a secondary hole beyond it. Thank you. And defect number six? Defect six is an elliptical hole, which perforates the driver's side front fender above the wheel well. The bullet which made this hole passed through the fender and then perforated the compartment under the hood, which houses the hood support strut. It then collided with the strut and damaged it. The direction of travel is front to back, slightly driver side to passenger side, and slightly downward. Thank you. And defect number eight? 
Defect number eight is an elliptical hole, which perforates the corner of the hood on the driver's side and near the base of the windshield. The bullet which made this hole passed through the hood and part of the plastic firewall underneath. It then perforated the driver's side lower corner of the windshield and entered the interior of the dashboard near the steering column. Now I have a note here. No bullet or fragments associated with defect eight were recovered from within the dashboard and no exit holes were found on the lower steering column cover. The direction of travel is front to back, driver's side to passenger side, and slightly downward. And Agent, drawing your attention to the photograph and the screen, whichever you can see best, we have the hole number eight marked here, is that correct? That's right. And is this the trajectory rod that's referenced in your report? It is. And it enters the hood of the patrol vehicle? Yes. And then the bullet proceeds underneath the hood and then goes through the windshield of the patrol vehicle? Yes. And that's where we can see the trajectory rod going through both components? Yes. <clears throat> And defect number nine, can you describe that? Yes. Defect nine is a large, slightly oval-shaped hole which perforates the driver's side front fender behind the wheel well. The bullet which made this hole passed through the fender and then penetrated internal metal framing members. The direction of travel is front to back, driver's side to passenger side, and slightly downward. Thank you. I'll make this photograph the next exhibit, please. Exhibit six. And if you could pass that photograph to Ms. Leslie. Thank you. And Asian, if you can identify this photograph. This is a photograph of a close-up of the trajectory path of number eight, going through the hood and entering the uh, windshield. In, in this particular photograph, uh, we see the pink trajectory rod, is that correct? Yes. What is this item here? That looks like a, looks like a bullet jacket fragment. And we'll talk more later about bullet jackets and fragments, but just generally speaking, can you describe what a bullet is and then fragments from a bullet? Sure. Um, I've got a model here. You want me to? Yeah, absolutely. This is a model of a, a complete cartridge and a Cartridge is one unit of ammunition. It consists of the bullet, and this is what actually goes down the barrel when a weapon is fired. The cartridge case holds the gunpowder. It also has the primer. But those are the components and the components of a cartridge. And a bullet uh, may have a jacket material, usually a harder metal like copper. And it, within the jacket is a core, which may be composed of lead or other things. Thank you. <clears throat> Move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. And Agent, can you identify this photograph? This is another photograph of the patrol vehicle, and I've got uh, circles to highlight the, the locations of the defects on the, uh, the patrol vehicle. Okay. And just to clarify, we also see some defects in the windshield, but your analysis was not of the windshield, is that correct? I tested them for the presence of lead, and I found lead around those, uh, those holes, which is consistent with the passage of a bullet, but I have no information on the direction through glass. Thank you. I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. And agent, please identify this photograph. This is a photograph that, hold, that shows uh, defect 10, which is uh, damage to the spotlight on the vehicle. Uh, is, and if you're looking at the screen, is this Defect number 10? Yes, sir. Spotlight control vehicle? Yes. 
read that as exhibit number nine. And agent, referring back to your lab report, did you give a description of defect 10 in the lab report? I did. Defect 10 is a hole in the rear housing of the spotlight mounted to the exterior of the A pillar on the driver's side. Chemical testing revealed this hole to be consistent with bullet damage. However, directionality cannot be determined because of a lack of information about its position at the time of its shooting and a lack of a, a known associated secondary bullet damage. What does that mean? <laughs> that means I can't tell you the direction it was hit from. Okay. So, so in this case, if two people were shooting, you, you don't know which one caused this particular uh, hole? I, I can't tell you, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> uh, if you could identify this next photograph, please. This is a photograph of uh, the bullet defects on the driver door. I've got them labeled as number 13 and number 12. And can you give a description of defects 12 and 13, please? Yes. Defects 12 and 13 are non-perforating circular divots on the surface of the driver door. Chemical testing revealed that these defects test positive for the presence of lead. And that finding is consistent with the impact of bullets or bullet fragments. All right. I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. Agent, if you will please identify this photograph. This is a photograph uh, inside the vehicle of the A-pillar, damage to the A-pillar, which I've labeled as uh, 11. And can you give a further description of 11, please? I found that examination and chemical testing of the interior of the vehicle in Exhibit 2A revealed a glancing defect, which I've labeled as 11, which is consistent with bullet damage to the upper A pillar on the driver's side. The trajectory of the bullet which made this defect cannot be definitively determined due to a lack of a usable secondary impact point. And then I have a note, a medium caliber bullet base was recovered from within the A pillar. And gunshot residue was found around defect number 11. Thank you. I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. The 11. And agent, please identify this photograph. This is a photograph of the windshield of the patrol vehicle that I examined. The letters are, indicate each of the um, holes or defects in the, the windshield. And I believe in, in this labeling of the windshield, you have letters A through J, is that correct? Or A through K, you can't see K in this photograph. Yeah, I see A through J on this. And in your lab report, did you make a note about uh, these defects? I did. And what was that? Further examination of the vehicle in Exhibit 2 revealed a total of 11 holes and defects in the windshield and the driver's side window. These holes and defects are labeled A through K. Chemical testing revealed that all 11 of these holes and defects contain lead. This finding is consistent with the passage of or impact of a bullet or bullet fragments. Thank you. And I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. And Agent, if you will, please identify the, this document. This is a copy of the um, official TBI uh, report, which uh, reflects the uh, results of the examinations that I'm, I just gave you. Is that the report that was issued on August 15th, 2022? It is. I'll move that as the next exhibit, please. <clears throat> Your Honor, may 
I'd like to briefly request a jury out. You want a jury out? Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we'll step out for a moment. <laughs> Agent Broadhag, I think we concluded with your testimony of the lab report, and I'd like to move that as Exhibit 13, please. Exhibit 13. Agent Broadhag, I'm now going to be referring your attention to a lab report that was issued on October the 27th of 2022. Do you have a copy of that? Yes, sir, I do. And before we start talking in detail, uh, I want to ask you to identify several exhibits. I'm going to start with what has been marked as TBI exhibit number 18A. If you could identify this, please. <coughs> yes, please. rifle that I examined, it's TBI Exhibit 18A. And Agent, can you uh, briefly describe this rifle for the jury, please? This is an AR-15 type rifle. The way it's loaded, how it works is there's a magazine, which is just a box that holds the ammunition, that's inserted into the mag well, and then the, uh, the charging handle is brought back, that brings the bolt back. And releasing it, there's a spring that brings the bolt back forward, and it takes a cartridge off the top of that magazine, loads it at the cha in the chamber. When I bring the charging handle back, it also cocks an internal hammer within the receiver. At that point, if the safety is off, and here's the safety here, if that's an off position, uh, pulling the trigger will fire the weapon. Thank you. And does this rifle have a serial number? It does. And what is that number? Serial number of this rifle is SX46781. Thank you. And Agent Broadhag, when you receive this rifle, uh, how do you go about examining it and to and do you determine if it's in working order? Yes, I do. Okay, how do you do that? Uh, the first thing I'll do is take it out of the box, lock the action open. This rifle, the action's already open, and I can see that it's clear. There's nothing in the chamber. There's nothing in the bag well, so it's clear it can't be fired. Uh, at that point, I'll take some pictures of it and um, take some measurements, things like the barrel length, the trigger pull weight, things of that sort. And uh, I'll test fire it, collect those test fired cartridge cases and bullets for later comparison with evidence. Okay, thank you. And Your Honor, at this time, I would move the rifle as the state's exhibit number 14 in this trial. All right, exhibit 14. Agent, if you could identify. 
This is TBI Exhibit 19B. This is the magazine that was submitted with the rifle. And 19B uh, is a magazine, and is that what you were referring to in your earlier testimony? That's correct. This is what holds the ammunition. The cartridges are placed in here. There's a spring-loaded follower, that orange thing there. It applies upward pressure on those cartridge cartridges. But this is the magazine that uh, was submitted with the rifle. Is there anything else inside of that package? Or just the magazine? I also received three unfired cartridges. Thank you. And can you identify those cartridges? Yes. There's two of them right there. They're 5.56 by 45 caliber. And the third one, I disassembled. I pulled the bullet out of it, cut it in half to see what was inside the bullet. Got, oops, got the gunpowder. And a cartridge case. And AJ, you testified that uh, these are 5.56, is that correct? Yes, sir. And what type of ammunition does the rifle that you were just holding uh, use? It's chambered for 5.56 by 45. Okay. What, what does that mean, 5.56 by 45? That refers to the dimensions of the cartridge. The width of the bullet is 5.56 millimeter. Uh, so it would be 223. 5.56, and the 45 is the, uh, the length of the cartridge case from the mouth down to the bottom. And can you, is there anything unique or specific about this type of ammunition or this bullet? I uh, cut open one of the bullets. They're all consistent. They have this green tip. I don't know if you all can see from here, but the bullets have a green painted tip. And uh, that may mean that it's a, a penetrator round. It contains a steel cone within the core. There's a little bit of lead on this end of the bullet and a steel cone near the nose of the bullet. Did you describe it as a penetrator bullet? Yes, sir. Okay. And Your Honor, I'm going to move the magazine and the cartridges and everything that we see here as collective exhibit 15. I want to give Agent Broadhag a moment to get it all packaged back up into the TBI uh, exhibit bag, please. Agent Broadhag, I'm, I'm about to uh, hand you what has been marked by the TBI as uh, TBI exhibits 03, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Can you go through those and confirm that those are TBI exhibits 03 through 14? Yes. All right. And I don't want to unseal all of them. Uh, I would like you to look at TBI exhibit 03 and open up and, and describe the contents. Case. Again, it's 5.56 by and, and just for uh, understanding, you previously described uh, State's Exhibit 15 as an unfired round, is that correct? Uh, In the previous exhibit, the green tip? Yes, those were all three of those were unfired. So after the bullet propels from the shell, is that what remains? Yeah. The, uh, a rifle of this sword, when the primer is struck, it sends fire up the flash hole within the cartridge case to ignite the gunpowder. When that gunpowder burns, it produces gases under a lot of pressure. It sends the bullet on out the barrel. It also acts on the cartridge case to uh, bring the weapon back. I'm sorry, I misspoke. On this type of weapon, that gas behind the bullet 
is shunted to a tube through the barrel and backward towards the bolt and bolt carrier. So it brings that bolt and bolt carrier backward. It'll extract that empty cartridge case and eject it out of the weapon. Then when the bolt and bolt carrier comes back home, it's gonna take a new cartridge off the top of the magazine and load it into the chamber. Thank you. Uh, and Agent, if you would repackage uh, the shell casing into ex TBI Exhibit 03, please. And I will move that as State's Exhibit number 16. And Agent Broadhag, I believe you tested a total of 14 cartridges or shell casings of the 556 five, uh, make, is that correct? That's right. And do you have in your possession TBI Exhibit 05? Yes, sir, I do. And what's the description of that without opening it? 5A, TBI Exhibit 5A, is one fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. Thank you. I'll move that as Exhibit 17, please. And TBI Exhibit 06, can you describe it? Exhibit 6A is four fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge cases from the ground. Thank you. I'll move that as Exhibit 18, please. And TBI Exhibit 08. Exhibit 8A is one fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. Thank you. I'll move that as exhibit 20. Did I skip one? There's a seven. Nine. Nine. Not two. Nineteen. Nineteen. All right. And agent, what is the next TBI exhibit that you have in front of you? I have a TBI exhibit seven, which is also one fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. Thank you. And I'll move that as the next exhibit, please. Madam Clerk, is that giving you enough time to write the numbers? All right. What number was that? 20. 20, thank you. And Agent, can you identify the next item, please? This next one is 9A, TBI Exhibit 9A. It also has a fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case uh, from the ground near a brush line. Thank you. I'll move that as Exhibit 21. And agent, if you could identify the next item. TBI exhibit 10A is also a fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. Thank you. And I will move that as the state's exhibit number 22. Agent, if you can describe the next item, please. TBI Exhibit 11A is also a fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. I'll move that as State's Exhibit 23. And the next item. Exhibit 12A, one fired 5.56 millimeter by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. Thank you. I'll move that to State's Exhibit 24. Hey, Agent, you should have what's labeled as TBI Exhibit 13A, is that correct? Yes, I have 13 and yes. And can you describe 13, please? 13A is one fired 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge case from the ground. I'll move that as the state's exhibit 25. 
And you should have one last package in front of you. Is that correct, Agent? Yes, sir. I've got uh, 14A, one fired 5.56 by 45 cartridge case from the ground near a brush line. Thank you. I'll move that to state's exhibit number 26. Okay. Agent, can I move five minutes, please? Would you like me to take this one out? Yes. This is TBI exhibit 17A. It's one fire jacketed bullet that was recovered from behind the passenger area of the patrol car. <clears throat> and I'll move that to state's exhibit number 27. One last exhibit. Can identify that, please. This is TBI exhibit sixty three A. It's bullet fragments from near the fan belt in the engine compartment of the uh, patrol vehicle. And I'll move that as state's exhibit number 28. You dim the light. Agent, if you can identify this photograph, please. This is a photograph of the rifle that I examined. It's TBI exhibit 18A. All right, and this is a photograph of the rifle that's already been made in exhibit at this trial number 14, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Move that photograph as the next exhibit number 29. <coughs> And Adrian, if you can identify the photograph that I've just placed in front of you. This is a photograph of the magazine I examine, uh, TBI exhibit 19A, and also the three unfired cartridges that were submitted with the magazine, which is TBI exhibit uh, 19B. Thank you. Move that as exhibit number 30. This is a photograph of the interior of the patrol vehicle where the uh, that arrow is kind of in the middle right. Uh, it points to the bullet exhibits 17A, TBI exhibit 17A. So Agent Brawhag, in this particular case, you've already opened and shown the jury TBI exhibit 17A, is that correct? That's right. And this bullet was found in the patrol car behind the passenger seat? Yes. And this, for trial purposes, uh, is exhibit 27 in the trial. <clears throat> I'll move that photograph as exhibit 31, please. Please identify that photograph. This is a photograph of the bullet in 17A that I showed you earlier. All right. 
So 17A is the bullet that was found behind the passenger seat of the patrol car. Yes. And are these close-up photographs of 17A, the bullet? Yes, they are. And can you describe what you see? The picture on the left shows the position within the patrol car where they recovered the bullet, 17A. The two, the one in the middle and the one on the right are different photographs of different angles of the same item, the bullet in 17A. In the center photograph, you can see part of that steel penetrator protruding from out of the nose. It's, um, the penetrator is cone shaped, but the pointed part is, is flat. So and that's, that's what's sticking out of the front of the, uh, the bullet there. Am I pointing towards the penetrator? Yes. I'll move that photograph as exhibit number 32. Agent, when you compare bullets and rifles, what are class, what do you mean by class characteristics? Class characteristics are marks which occur on the surface of a bullet because of the design of the weapon out of which they're fired. Um, an example of that would be the, the dimensions of the lands, uh, the land impressions. Lands and grooves are the way make up the rifling of a rifled weapon. On the inside surface of the barrel, these lands and grooves, these raised and recessed areas, spiral down the inside of the barrel from the muzzle end towards the breech end. And what they do is they impart a spin to that bullet as it's going down the, uh, down the barrel. But uh, that would be an example of the dimensions of these marks on the bullet and the direction of twist it imparts to the bullet. All of that existed on paper before the weapon was first built. So it's a design characteristic that leaves marks on a, on a bullet. It can also appear on cartridge cases. Okay. And in this particular case, did you do that examination, compare uh, this bullet to the rifle? I did, I, not directly. I'll, I'll test fire the weapon and collect the bullets. In the lab, we have a large stainless steel tank of water. So I'll load it with ammunition that's similar to the ammunition submitted as evidence and fire that rifle into the, the tank of water. The bullet loses all its energy and just sinks to the bottom, but that's how I get my test fired bullets. When I get those, I'll bring them back to the scope and compare them to each other. I've got a comparison scope that allows me to look at two objects under magnification simultaneously. When I do that, I can find the marks that are unique to that particular firearm. Known examples of that will appear on each of those fired test bullets. The next step for me to do is to compare the one of the test bullets against the bullet submitted as evidence, in this case, 17A. Thank you. Can you identify this photograph? This is a photograph of the rifle on the left. On the right is um, the bullet that I compared to it. And again, it was test, uh, that bullet was compared to test fired bullets from the rifle. And what was the result? I saw that they shared class characteristics. The rifling dimensions on the surface of the bullet are the same as the dimensions of the rifling on the test bullets, but that in itself is not enough to ID it uh, to, definitively to the, to the gun. I also saw some individual characteristics, which are, kind of mar which are markings which are unique to the firearm on the surface, but are not enough where I could say definitively that it had been fired through. Thank you. I'll move that photograph as Exhibit 33. This is a photograph of one of the, the bullets from the three, I, I pulled a bullet from one of the three unfired cartridges in 19B, TBI exhibit 19B, and I took a Dremel tool, a cutting wheel, cut across the top of the jacket so you could see what it consisted of. So what you're seeing up there on the screen to the left is the steel part, the penetrator, and then to the right of that is lead core, and then the, the part that slid down the center is the jacket material. Thank you. I'll move that photograph as exhibit 34. Agent, did you examine or compare 
the three unfired bullets with exhibit 17A, the fired jacketed bullet in the vehicle and uh, exhibit 63, which was uh, bullet fragments from the engine compartment of the patrol vehicle? I did, all those were similar of design. They all had that steel penetrator. Photograph up on the screen, 63A is TBI exhibit 63A. Um, you can see the penetrator on the left there. Those, the center photograph is of the three unfired cartridges, uh, one of which I removed a bullet and cut open the bullet to reveal the penetrator. The picture on the right is the bullet 17A and where it was located within the patrol vehicle. I'll move that exhibit, as states exhibit 35. <clears throat> and agent, please identify this photograph. This is a photograph of the head stamp area of TBI exhibit 12A. It's just an overall shot. You can see the uh, markings on the head stamp, which on the model be this part of the cartridge. Um, LC is Lake City. That's where it was manufactured. 20 was the year of manufacture. Uh, the little cross, there's a little NATO stamp at about the lower right side. You can see the uh, depression from where the firing pin struck the primer in the center of the primer there. But that's a representative image of the type of uh, markings I saw on the cartridge, cartridge cases that were submitted. And what is the purple dot? Oh, that's just an index point. That you put on there? I did. Okay. And why do you put an index point? If another examiner wants to look at it, they can orient it the same way the other to another cartridge case. I'll have a purple dot on that as well so they can get it in the correct orientation under the microscope. Move that photograph as exhibit 36, please. <clears throat> so, Agent Broadhag, at this point, you have testified about the actual bullet, uh, which is propelled from the casing. Uh, now we're starting to talk about the casing, is that correct? Yes, sir, the cartridge case. The cartridge case. And we've moved those cartridge cases into evidence. What, what do you do to determine if a cartridge casing is fired from a particular weapon. Like with the bullet, I'm gonna test fire the weapon and collect those test fired cartridge cases. And that's what I did in this case. I took the rifle I showed you earlier. I test fired it and collected the cartridge cases and then took the cartridge cases back to my comparison scope and compared them against each other to find those markings which are unique to that particular rifle. I then compare the cartridge case, one of the test fire, I, typically I'll put it on the right side. And then on the left side, I'll put the evidence cartridge case to see if there are similarities. Thank you. And can you identify this photograph? This is a photograph that was taken under the comparison microscope. It's kind of difficult to see, but there's a line down the center there and on the right side is a test fired cartridge case and on the left is an evidence cartridge case which was uh tbi exhibit 6a4 i believe and what you're looking at there are extractor marks when the cartridge case is removed from the chamber there's an extractor that pulls it out as the bolt and bolt carrier come back and uh, it'll leave markings on the edge of the uh, extractor group so what you're seeing there is marks left by the extractor on the extractor group. Agent Brown, have you testified there, there was a line? Are you referring to this center line? Yes, sir. Are these are two separate images? Yes. The one on the right is a test-fired cartridge case. The one on the left <laughs> is an evidence cartridge case. You're using a microscope, please? Yes, sir, a comparison microscope. That's like two microscopes fused together uh, by a device called an optical bridge. And again, it lets me look at two objects under magnification at the same time. And Agent Broadhead, when I see these photographs, what, what are these on this photograph on the right? What is this area here? Those are the extractor marks. That's where the extractor goes into the extractor groove and helps assist in its removal from the chamber and out of the ejection port of the weapon when it's fired. 
And on the separate picture to the left, what is this area? That's the same thing. And what do you observe? They match. They match. And what does that tell us? That that cartridge case on the left, the evidence cartridge case, was chambered in and extracted from the same weapon as the test fired uh, cartridge case. And that would be the rifle that was collected? From, from the rifle. And you tested and compared 14 separate cartridge casings, is that correct? I did. And what was the result? I found that all 14 of those cartridge cases had been chambered in and extracted from that particular rifle. Can you identify this photograph? But before you do, let me move the last photograph as the state's next exhibit, which is 37, please. Thank you. This is a photograph of the evidence fired cartridge cases that I examined. I'll take a picture of each one individually with our uh, barcode sticker just to, for identification purposes. There's also a picture of the rifle TBI exhibit 18A. And I ID all those cartridge cases that haven't been chambered in and extracted from that particular rifle 18A. Thank you. I'll move that to state's exhibit 38. <laughs> and please identify this photograph. This is also a photograph of cartridge cases and, uh, and also the rifle, an 18A. So what does it mean that this, there's an agreement of class and individual characteristics within the extractor marks? It means class is in the overall shape of the extractor mark, but the little scratches within the extractor mark are absolutely unique to that firearm. We call them individual characteristics or uh, it can, you can think of it as like a mechanical fingerprint of the firearm. Those markings are unique to that particular extractor on that rifle. So in this case, the rifle that you tested leaves a unique print on these cartridge casings. Yes. I'll move that as States Exhibit 39. And Agent, if you could identify this photograph. I also examined some uh, nine millimeter Luger caliber cartridge cases. And this is a photograph of three of them, TBI exhibits um, 60A. And what, nine millimeter, can you tell us more information? What is a nine millimeter? Nine millimeter Luger is a particular cartridge. Um, I also received a, a pistol to examine in this case, and it was chambered for that particular cartridge, nine millimeter Luger. Thank you. And I'll move that photograph as uh, state's exhibit number 40. Agent, please identify this document. This is an official report of my examination of the firearms that were submitted and also the cartridge cases and bullets and bullet fragments. And does this report uh, detail uh, the description and identification of all the evidence that we've seen and presented uh, both through the PowerPoint and the physical exhibits? Yes, sir, it does. And I will move this lab report as uh, state's exhibit number 41. Your Honor, if I could just have a second. I'll pass the witness. Is it Agent Broadhag? Am I pronouncing it's that? Broadhag. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Agent
agent. Do you know who the registered owner of that weapon was? Which weapon? I'm sorry. The uh, the long rifle. No, sir, I don't. Okay. Do you know who owned the nine millimeter? I believe it was the officer's weapon. Okay. And <clears throat> did did you have the any of these shell casings tested for fingerprints? I I personally did not. I I work in firearms, so. Okay. And you said that you couldn't tell which. You you said you couldn't tell which. Uh, when you were going through the trajectory, you couldn't tell which uh, impacts were coming out and which ones were coming in? In the glass, I can tell you about the ones that hit the body work. Okay, but you can't tell as far as the windshield goes? No. As far as the glass? No, that's a microanalysis section. You can't tell in which order they were fired either, right? No, sir, I can't. Okay. I have a moment, Your Honor. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Redirect. Thank you, Agent. You may step down. Are we releasing him from his subpoena? Yes, sir. You may go about your business. Thank you. <clears throat> Which one? 14. I couldn't hear you. Why? <laughs> you may call your next one. State calls Lindsay Anderson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you state your full name for the court, please? Lindsay Anderson. Thank you. Will you spell your first and last name? L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E Thank you. And uh, Ms. Anderson, where do you work? I'm employed at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Nashville Crime Laboratory. Thank you. And Agent Anderson, how long have you been employed there? Oh, approximately seven and a half years. And which area do you work in? I work in the microanalysis unit, also more commonly referred to as trace evidence. Okay. What is microanalysis and trace evidence? It's basically the study of smaller items of evidence. So we um, examine things such as um, gunshot residue, which are microscopic particles, tiny glass shards, paint fragments, that kind of thing. Thank you. Can you identify this document? Yes, this is a copy of my CV. All right. And will you tell us your prior work experience and training? <clears throat> I graduated with my Bachelor of Science in ACS Certified Chemistry in um, 2015. And after that, I was employed for about a year at a pesticide development company in Missouri. Um, after that, and approximately, I think it was July of 2016, I began working at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, where I started my training to perform a, very, a variety of testing. How do you become uh, specialized in microanalysis? So it's all on the job training. Um, in microanalysis, we have a lot of subdisciplines. So about my first five years was spent juggling training as well as casework. Um, so I am trained in five different subdisciplines, and each of those trainings took roughly a year. Um, and have you previously been qualified as an expert in court? I have, yes. About how many times? I believe this is number 23. Your Honor, I would tender uh, Agent Anderson as an expert in microanalysis. Mr. Stratton, do you have any board hour you wish to ask? No board hour, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, we will qualify this witness as an expert in trace evidence and uh, microanalysis. And Agent Anderson, I'm going to be referring to a report that was issued on August the 8th of 2022. Do you have a copy of that report? I have August 8th, 23. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's August the 8th, 2023. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
referring to the August 8th, 2023 report, uh, what did you examine? I examined a 2018 Dodge Charger, which was a police cruiser. All right. And I'm going to draw your attention to the screen. And if you could identify this first photograph, please. Yes, this is the front uh, windshield of that police cruiser. And in your assignment in this particular case was glass analysis, is that correct? Correct. Um, one of the disciplines that I perform is glass analysis, and that includes a variety of things. In this case, I was looking at broken glass in order to determine direction of force and order of breakage. And if you can identify this photograph. Yes, this appears to be the same photograph that's on the screen. Thank you. And I will move that photograph as the state's next exhibit. <coughs> And Madam Clerk, what number is that? 42. This is 42. Yes, sir. On the screen, correct. Photograph on the screen is States Exhibit 42. And agents, you can just set it right there. Thank you. Agent, can you identify this? Yes, this is a shot a little further away of that same windshield, as well as the front driver side window, which is on the screen. And Agent, we've already heard testimony from uh, Agent Broadhack, who uh, described the numbers and the defects in the vehicle, but your analysis was of the defects in the glass, and they're described by letters, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, a through K? Yes. And I'll move this as State's Exhibit number 43. Can you identify this photograph? That's not a photograph, a diagram. Yes. This is a diagram that I had a, another, um, another laboratory employee make for me to make the impacts a little more clear from what was in the front windshield. Okay. So <clears throat> backing up just a step, you're looking at glass and the defects in glass. Is that correct? Correct. More specifically, what are you trying to determine when looking at the glass? I am trying to determine what direction the force was traveling when it um, impacted the glass, as well as, if possible, which impact came first. Okay. Um, how do you do that? So for direction of force, um, specifically for these, these were what we call high velocity impacts. Generally, that means a bullet. Um, that impact is created by a projectile that's moving at a speed that will cause what we call coning on the exit side of the glass so that projectile will reach the outer for outer pane of the glass and basically radiate the force out the back and that will cause the back side of it to shatter so you're left with a coning shape on the exit side of the glass and that's how i determine direction of force for order of breakage um, the basic explanation of it is I'm looking at cracks that uh, propagate from those impacts and interact with each other um, because the basic rule is that a crack that is propagating will not cross a pre-existing crack. So I can look at those intersections to possibly determine which impact came first. Okay, so let's kind of break that down into two different categories. Yes. Let's look at the direction first and based on uh, your testing, in this diagram, can you uh, tell us um, the direction of travel travel for these lettered defects? Yes, so A through G, all of the yellow dots were high velocity impacts traveling from the inside of the vehicle to the outside. Um, impact I was a high velocity impact that actually did not penetrate all the way to, through the pane and it originated from the outside. Um, impacts H and J were inconclusive for me because they were too damaged for me to be able to determine the direction. And when you say too damaged, the hole was too damaged, the glass was too damaged? Or... So when a bullet passes through a windshield, there needs to be enough glass left around that actual hole through it for me to be able to do my analysis. In this case, either just because um, of traveling, moving the vehicle to the lab, something like that, that glass around the actual impact was gone. Um, so I couldn't see any coning on either side for me to be able to make my determination. I will move that diagram as the state's next exhibit, please. 44.
And as you can you identify this diagram? Yes. This is a final diagram of the front driver's side window that is on the screen up there. And what do we have here? This shows one penetrating impact, again, high velocity, and it was traveling from the outside of the vehicle to the inside. So this is a red dot, and, yes. it's, and it's depicting high velocity penetrating from exterior vehicle outside to the inside. Correct. We've got this state's exhibit number 45. And agent, after you do these examinations, are your findings reflected in a report? Yes, they are. Yes, this appears to be a copy of my report dated 8-8-23. And does it accurately describe the findings you've just testified to? It does. And I'll move that as state's exhibit number 46. 46. I'll pass the witness. Brad, you can cross it down. Agent Anderson, did you? Did you say the in the diagrams, and I'm not sure what the exhibit numbers were, but if you need to the exhibit there with the with all the showing the front windshield portion mm -hmm. of everything you still have that there yes i do okay and so you only know is it number i it's like you can only tell the jury that the one bullet came from the outside in right the other two were inconclusive and the other the rest of those came from the inside being fired out right on that particular diagram yes Okay. And then on K, you say that one came from the outside in, right? Correct. All right. And that would be on the, the driver's side door of the yes. vehicle? Okay. So if somebody were facing that vehicle, and you, do you know which order that, that those shots were fired at all? Um, I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, in my notes, I could make a determination on the grouping that all came from the inside. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I could not make any determinations because there were not enough interaction between the cracks. <clears throat> okay. Did you, it, this is, so you only analyze the glass, right? Correct. Okay. And so you don't know if num letters H, J, and K, you don't have a clue what order those came in? Correct. But, so you wouldn't know whether or not somebody was moving away from that vehicle and shooting them, would you? No, I cannot tell anything except what direction that force was traveling when it actually impacted the glass. And you can't, also, you can't tell um, how quickly that happened, can you? No. From your analysis? No, I cannot. Okay. <clears throat> and you did an amended report, didn't you? I did. There was a clerical error in the original report that I corrected with an amended report. That, that clerical error is where you, did you say you examined the wrong vehicle or something? <clears throat> so what happened on that was that the um, exhibit that was related in our computer system to this report mm -hmm. was entered as the wrong one. The vehicle that I actually examined was the correct one the incorrect exhibit was related to the report and printed on the report so that needed fixed so you say it was entered into your computer incorrectly Did it was not entered into the computer incorrectly i associated the wrong exhibit the way our um, system works is that i will type in my report and then the list of all of the evidence is given to me as an option to associate to my report and i accidentally pulled in the wrong one mm -hmm. okay Without looking, at, well, you still have the exhibits. I keep forgetting we've turned the TV off there. Without looking at that, if we go back to the to the diagram with A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, if somebody were sitting in a vehicle stationary, those would be the most likely points of impact for somebody coming head on had they been fired into the vehicle. Is that fair? Can you restate the question? What I'm saying is basically, if you're sitting behind a steering wheel, mm -hmm. 
where the bullets are going out, if somebody were, were attempting to shoot somebody, those would be where, where the bullets are going out. Those, if, those would be where they would most likely be coming in if somebody was, was trying to do that while they were sitting in the vehicle. She's calling for her to make a, spec, to speculate. There's no way she can possibly answer that. I will draw the question. All right, who's withdrawing? One minute, Your Honor. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Is there any way to tell whether or not any of these were ricochet impacts? Um, not specifically, no. Impact I um, that did not penetrate is, I might consider that as a possibility for a ricochet, but I really can't say. Okay. <clears throat> so is there somebody else in the Bureau that can identify whether or not something was a ricochet impact? It's possible that someone in firearms could, but I'm not certain. Okay. I'll pass the witness. Be direct. Agent, just, just to be clear, there's no mistake that you examined the glass defects in a patrol car. That's correct. All of my photos and notes are from the patrol car. All I did was associate the incorrect number of exhibit on my printed report. Thank you. Anything further? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you, Agent. You may step down. We're releasing her from her subpoena. Yes. You may go about your business. Mr. Crouch, you may call your next witness. Call well, Agent Jennifer Sullivan, Your Honor. To this, I believe Agent Sullivan's testimony is going to be related to controlled substances found in the vehicle. And Mr. Brown's not charged with any Controlled Substance Act violations, so we would argue that those are, are not relevant and any relevancy would be substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice under Rule 403. I disagree, Judge. The fact that he has controlled substances in the vehicle could give him motive to shoot at a police officer who pulls him over and may search his vehicle. So that would be the relevance, is motive. Well, <clears throat> in this particular case, my understanding, if I recall correctly, was that there was a pretrial hearing in which we discussed the evidence from Louisiana being introduced in this case, which might have shown motive for uh, him to avoid being arrested um, and the state agreed that they would not introduce that evidence and I assume then you were relying upon this evidence to show motive as to why he would have resisted arrest. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Spratt, um, because of the fact that we have had, and I'll be glad to let you have a final say if you want, <clears throat> because of the fact that we had a pretrial uh, hearings in which the state elected not to uh, put on evidence of the fact that um, the defendant in this case was a suspect in a murder in Louisiana and that precipitated his fleeing that jurisdiction and coming to the state of Tennessee, that the state elected not to do that, uh, then obviously I think that by declining or deciding not to do that, they were uh, relying upon the fact that they would be able to introduce evidence that there was a controlled substance within the car. It is true he was not charged with that offense, but I think that it does show motive and therefore the relevance would outweigh any prejudicial effect. I will instruct the jury that it's being uh, introduced for a limited purpose only and they are not to consider it for any purpose other than any motive that it might have given the defendant to avoid arrest. Anything before we bring the jury in? All right.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, in your absence, I took up the matter, and <clears throat> what I want to give you is what we call a limiting instruction. Uh, this witness is being called by the state to testify about certain substances that were located within the uh, vehicle that was allegedly operated by the defendant in this case. Uh, those uh, appear to be, from what I'm understanding, some sort of controlled substances. That uh, this defendant is not charged with the possession of any illegal drugs or any controlled substances, but I am allowing <clears throat> that introduction over the defense's objection uh, to because it, the state is contending that that represents the motive that the defendant had for not being uh, for resisting arrest and and why it led to this confrontation. So I am instructing you that you may not consider the. Uh, evidence of any sort of controlled substance on the guilt or innocence of or hold it against him for possessing it, but you can consider it only as it might go to motive for the defendant in resisting arrest. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you state and spell your first and last name, please? Yes, Jennifer Sullivan, J E N N I F E R S U L L I V A N. How are you employed? I'm employed as a special agent forensic scientist at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Laboratory in Nashville as um, in the forensic chemistry unit. And what kind of uh, education and uh, training did you go through to, to do that job? I have a bachelor of science degree from the University of Tennessee at Martin. After graduating there, I worked in the environmental field for about five years as an analytical chemist. I left there, I came to work for the Bureau in 2006, where I've been employed in the Forensic Chemistry Unit since then. And upon my employment there, I completed the uh, training program that we have set forth in our unit, as well as a competency test at the end of that, and we are then proficiency tested every year. Right. I'm going to hand you a document and ask you. <coughs> I do. What is that? This is a copy of my CV that I sent you. All right. And is that an updated copy of your CV? Yes. All right. Your Honor, I'd ask to make that the next exhibit, please. Be marked as Exhibit 47. And Agent Sullivan, have you been uh, qualified as an expert in the courts of Tennessee before? I have. Uh, approximately how many times? I've been qualified over 80 times. So I'm not sure the exact count. And in what area are you? have you been qualified? Uh, drug identification. Your Honor, I'd uh, tender Agent Sullivan a witness and drug, expert witness and drug identification. Do you have any questions? I do, Your Honor. Agent Sullivan, do you, um, do you have any training in identifying the effects of these substances? I do not. You do not? No. Okay. So you don't know if they cause any kind of uh, excitement or passion or anything like that, the substances that you're about to testify to? You don't know what the effects of those are? No, I don't testify to the effects of drugs. Okay. And so you're just an expert in the identification of what the substances are? That is correct. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Then I will qualify this witness as an expert in drug identification. Agent Sullivan, I'm going to hand you another document here. You recognize that document? Yes, this is a copy of my official forensic chemistry report. And is the issue date uh, September the 30th of 2022 on that? Yes, it is. All right. If you will briefly explain how um, a substance a substance comes into your possession to be tested and kind of your what you do. Sure. Uh, so evidence is submitted to the laboratory through the evidence receiving unit, and once it comes into the evidence receiving unit, they uh, it's all it comes in with a submission form or a request for examination form, and they take information from that form and they enter it into our laboratory information management system or our LIM system. So everything's put in the LIM system where these reports are generated from and a lot of the informa information is from. And then once they enter all that into our LIM system, it generates a barcode and a laboratory no case number and that's all those markings and numbers are put on the evidence. 
and then the evidence is placed into the vault. And the evidence will remain into the vault until I request it for examination. So I request the evidence for examination and then I work or examine the evidence and analyze it. And when I'm finished with it, I take the evidence back to the vault where it remains until the submitting agency picks it up. And after I examine the evidence, I then prepare a report that's then peer reviewed and sent out. All right, and was that process followed in this case? Yes. All right, I wanna direct your attention to TBI exhibit 46A, and what is that? 46A is described as plant material from driver's side front door panel of Sonata. I'm going to hand you some gloves as well as a... Okay. Yeah, but I'll take these. If you would first kind of explain the markings on the package to the jury. Sure. So... These markings were placed by the submitting officer or agency here on the top, initials and date. These markings were placed by our evidence, I'm sorry, our evidence receiving unit would have put these markings on there. That's a laboratory case number and then the barcode that's generated. And these markings here are placed by myself with the laboratory case number, exhibit number, initials, date, and this submitting agency, as well as the the TBI tape at the bottom where I sealed it when I was finished with it, with the laboratory case number initials on one side and my in date that I sealed it initials on the other. All right. And if you would open that package and, and show the jury its contents. Okay. I do, you, I do not have anything to open this with. Do we have scissors or? I mean, people are talking about you, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> It wasn't a switchblade, was it? All right. So on the inside, we have a plastic bag. You want me to continue to describe what's Please. in here? Okay. There's one plastic bag on the inside that this was sealed by um, the submitting person. In this case, I think it was another laboratory personnel because it came out of the car. So evidence tape, initials, date, and then on the bottom is where I sealed it. And these are my markings I placed here on it with all the same information I previously described. And these are the markings that were placed on it by the person that submitted it. All right. And did you perform any testing on the contents of that bag? I did. I performed analysis on this plant material. Tell if you would explain that to the jury. So the analysis that uh, we do in our laboratory and that I did on this um, plant material is we do a macroscopic analysis, it's, which is where you look at it with your naked eye and describe what you see a microscopic analysis where we look under a microscope and we're looking for specific botanical characteristics, uh, most specifically what we call cystolith hairs. They also have glandular hairs and covering or sample hairs. And then we perform a series of color tests on it. All right, and what did the color test tell you? So one color test tells us if it's positive for cannabinoids and then the other color tests we do um, let me look at my notes just a second. Tells us if it um, is presumptively hemp or presumptively marijuana. And what did it tell you in this case? That this was positive for cannabis and presumptively tested for marijuana. What was the total weight of the substance in the bag? The total weight of this substance without any packaging is 16.58 grams. Your Honor, has to make that the next exhibit, please. This is exhibit 48. And Agent, I'm going to hand you another bag here. And can you tell from the, the markings on the outside what, what it is that uh, is in that bag? Yes, this is Exhibit 48 from our laboratory um, based on the barcode here, which has the agency case number and exhibit or laboratory case number. I'm sorry, and exhibit number as well as my markings here that have that same information. All right. And if you would open that bag and show the jury its contents. So 
So inside of this brown paper bag are two Ziploc bags that contain um, various colors of tablets. Right. And have you seen tablets such as these before? I have. Right. And did you perform testing on any of those tablets? I did. I performed testing on the yellow tablets in this bag because they are in two separate packages. I have to treat them as two separate populations. And then we d divide them out into colors as separate exhibits. So I can't just test one and say everything's the same. So I just tested all the yellow ones or one of the yellow ones. And um, the one yellow one I tested in, there were 28 yellow tablets all together. I tested one of those and it was positive for methamphetamine. All right. And all of the other tablets, except for the color, were they consistent? Um, and characteristics with the yellow tablet this method yes brain. they all look very similar right. would you expect those to have the same result i would all right. and how many total tablets were there so a total all together tablets yes ma'am i think there's 179 tablets 179 tablets and you said 28 of those were the yellow tablets that's correct all right and if i could make that the next exhibit please your honor Agent Sullivan, the report that you're looking at, is that a complete uh, synopsis of, of your findings and a complete report? It is. All right, Your Honor, I have to make that the next exhibit, please. If I could have just a moment. Yeah, exhibit sure That's my question, Your Honor. Mr. Pratt, any questions? <clears throat> I'll let y'all catch up. Yes. What exhibit is the report? <laughs> exhibit Jeff. 50. Exhibit 50. The lab report. That was the last one. <clears throat> Agent Sullivan, how many murder trials have you testified in? I am not certain. Guess. A couple. Just a couple of murder trials? Probably. I don't usually testify in murder trials. Okay. All right. So how many attempted murder trials have you testified in? I'm not sure. That's not to say I haven't worked evidence in an attempted or murder trial. I'm just asking how many times you've testified. I, I don't recall. I would say not that many. Okay. All right. But you do test drugs. That's correct. Right. All right. And to this, to, to, to your report, how many yellow tablets did you say there were? Um, 28 total yellow tablets. Okay. You didn't test the other tablets? I did not test them. That's our policy. We do not test more than one tablet in an exhibit um, for nothing else for time's sake. If everything looks consistent, um, markings are consistent, the way the tablet's made is consistent, we um, infer that the population is all the same and it is reported out just like it's listed here on the comment. I understand that, but di didn't you say that there were two separate, they were separated into different colors? So is it your policy not to test the other color of what was going on? So, yes, um, okay. we test a limited amount of exhibits in every case. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually just one exhibit per case, depending on the circumstances of the case. Um, it could be different defendants, different locations, um, requests by ADA. There's just various reasons, and it's at the analyst's discretion as well at what they will test uh, based on scheduling, weight thresholds, different things. Okay, but what was the total number of tablets that you said? Uh, the total number of tablets in both bags, mm -hmm. that's all colors, not just the yellow ones. Mm -hmm. 179. Okay, so we don't have a clue what those other ones were. I did not test them. They are consistent with what I have seen. I would okay. expect them to be methamphetamine. But I didn't know I did not test them. Okay. What's the most amount of methamphetamine you've ever tested? Tablets or Any crystals? It, just crystals. I can recall a case that I actually testified on last year that was... I can't recall. I want to say it was like eight pounds, but I've tested thousands of pounds of methamphetamine. Okay. 
in a single case? Yes. Okay. That would have been like a crystalline substance type, type case. So not a tablet case, a crystalline substance. Different okay. preparation, I guess. And were those substances the were those substances the subject of your testimony in any of those murder trials that you'd ever been in or attempted murder trials that you'd ever been Not in? Not that I can recall, but once again okay. I've So this would be the first time it's fair to say that you've ever testified. <laughs> yeah, the relevance. I don't know what is the relevance, Mr. Spry. Just the jury was instructed that was the motive. I'm asking if she's ever testified that I'm asking if she's ever testified as to what her as to this being a motive before. But she didn't testify as to motive. Uh, the instructions as to whether or not they could be considered as to motive were from the court, not from this witness. I can't rebut that testimony. The Cross testimony, account. what testimony are you referring to? Ladies and gentlemen, step across, please. <clears throat> Number one, I don't recall this witness having made any testimony or testified in any way about these drugs being a motive for anything, and that's where I'm not certain what your question had to do with, but restate your question so I can make sure I'm understanding it. What I'm asking is how many times has she come into a court and testified that drugs were the motive for a murder or an attempted murder for that matter? Just simply asking that question. And if I don't get to ask that question, what will happen is in closing argument, it'll be a motive as the jury's been instructed. I'm just wondering how many times it's ever been the motive. That's not their real theory as to motive. It's kind of switched streams on me here in the middle of the trial. And that wasn't because they volunteered it. It was because I filed a motion to dismiss a count of the indictment that referenced what they think their real motive was. So, I mean, I'm just asking to cross examine her about how many times have you, I didn't have a clue that this was coming in as a motive until about 20 minutes ago. So all I'm asking your honor is that I be able to ask her how many times has she ever testified in any of the murder trials or attempted murder trials as to this being a motive for a crime, for a, for a murder or a homicide. That's all I'm asking. Hey, Mr. Spratt was given a witness list that had a lot of witnesses on it. We also gave him, although not required, a pared down witness list of the witnesses we expected to call. Agent Sullivan was on that list. Mr. Spratt has had Agent Sullivan's report since the, for a long time. We are not required to tell the defense what our motive is. And a question to this witness about have you ever used motive in a murder trial before is completely irrelevant and not something this witness should be able to answer. Motive is something we can argue to the jury. I didn't ask her about motive. The only thing we ask about is what are these drugs? And that's, so any other question about motive is going beyond what this witness could testify to. Well, <clears throat> number one, is the court that uh, allowed the testimony to come in and is the court that attributed the testimony to be considered not for the uh, determination that the defendant was guilty of an additional crime that he wasn't charged with, but rather whether or not the presence of those drugs could be considered as a motive for his resisting the stop and the arrest. And <clears throat> whether, the, whether the defense is in agreement with, that, with my ruling or not, that was the basis of my ruling. This witness didn't testify that in any way, shape, form, or fashion about the drugs being a part of a motive for the defendant. She only testified as to what they were. She identified them, which is her area of expertise. So to question her on cross-examination about how many times she had ever come into court and testified about um, motive, uh, drugs present in a situation being motive, would be far beyond the purpose of her testimony or even her testimony as, as a whole. And, and therefore, it would be purely speculative and would be outside, of, in this court's opinion, proper cross-examination. So I sustain the objection. We'll bring the jury back in, and it is correct. Hold on just a second. It is correct, now for the record, that the state does not have to tell the defendant what their, what their theory of the case is. They don't have to give them the motive that they're relying upon. They simply give them the facts and the evidence, and they can shift their theory of the case as far as the motive goes at any point in time, uh, based on the evidence as it unfurls during the trial. So for those reasons, I think it's a, it's a 
inappropriate to allow that line of questioning. So we're ready for the jury. Well, Your Honor, I'll pass the witness, Judge. So Agent Sullivan, when you got the eight pounds of, of methamphetamine or when you get a large quantity, is it typical to sample the entire quantity or take a sampling of it and test that? We take random samplings of things. So you wouldn't test the entire eight pounds had this been a crystal and substance case? That's correct. I would test it based on how it was packaged. And if it all came in one gallon size bag, I would take one sampling from that one bag. So it's similar to what you did in this case with the tablets? Yes. Nothing further, Judge. Nothing further. Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Agent. You may step down. You're released from your subpoena. I'm going to hand you a document here. That. Yes, this is a copy of my curriculum vitae. Does that list your training, education, and um, background? Yes, it does. Right, Your Honor, I asked to make that the next exhibit, please. All right, this would be exhibit 51. And Agent Castellano, have you been qualified as an expert in the courts of Tennessee before? Yes, I have. All right, and in what field? Um, usually forensic biologies. Do you have a guess of how many times you've been qualified? Uh, it's about 50 times. Your Honor, I tender Agent Castlebono an expert in forensic biology. Any questions? No questions, Your Honor. Right, should be qualified as an expert in the field of forensic biology. All right, Agent Castlebono, I'm going to hand you another document here. <clears throat> you recognize that? Yes, this is a copy of a report I issued on September 20th of 2022. Okay, so if you will tell the jury a little bit about uh, DNA and, and kind of what it is that you do. Okay, um, so DNA is our genetic material. You receive half of your DNA from your mother, the other half from your father. Um, it determines things like physical characteristics such as eye color, hair color, and um, no two people will have the same DNA profile except for identical twins. Okay. And are you able to take an unknown sample and compare that sample to a known standard? Yes. So we will attempt to get a DNA profile from evidence. And then if one is obtained, it can be compared to DNA standards from known individuals. And in this case, uh, looking at your lab report, did you have a known standard from BJ Brown? Yes, I did. I believe that was TBI exhibit 57A. That's correct. So when you get a known standard from a person, what do you do? Um, so I'll take a small cutting. Um, it's usually a cotton swab. So I'll take a small cutting of that and then take it through the DNA process. And ultimately, um, I will generate a DNA profile for comparison. Right. And on this lab report, there are a number of exhibits uh, that were submitted. Is that correct? Yes. So I want to go through, we won't go through all of everything that was uh, exhibited, or that was introduced and tested, um, but I do want to look at, um, we'll start with number 18A. Um, that's TBI exhibit 18A. What, okay. what was TBI exhibit 18A? Um, that was a rifle um, from Wells Creek in Aaron, Tennessee. Okay. And did you perform testing on that rifle? I did. All right. And what were the results of that test? Uh, so I swabbed the rifle. I swabbed the textured areas of the grip, foregrip, butt, safety, magazine release, and the end of the charging rod. And for the DNA results, the DNA profile obtained is consistent with the mixture of at least two individuals, including at least one male. Due to the limited profile obtained and an unknown number of potential contributors to the profile, this profile is inconclusive for comparison purposes. All right. So basically, there was some DNA on there, but we're not sure whose it is. Is that kind of what we're saying? Yes. Okay. And, and 19A, what is that exhibit? That was a rifle magazine also from Wells Creek. And was it tested as well? It was. What were the results of that? Um, the DNA profile obtained is consistent with the mixture of at least three individuals, including at least one male. Due to the complexity of the mixture, this profile is inconclusive for comparison purposes. So kind of the same situation. We know there's DNA, but we're not sure whose. That's correct. Tell us what a, a mixture is. What do you mean when you say a DNA mixture? Um, so a mixture is a sample that has DNA from more than one person in it. Okay. And does it get complicated to try to unmix and see who, who all is in there? 
It can be, especially when you start getting into more than two people. All right. And looking at 19B, what was that at TBI exhibit? Those were three um, cartridges, rifle cartridges from the magazine. All right. And was testing performed on those? Yes. And what was the results of that? Um, testing with real-time PCR did not indicate the presence of human DNA. No further testing was performed. Okay. So couldn't find anything on that one? That's correct. Now, skipping down to 22A, what is that exhibit? Um, those are swabs from the steering wheel of Hyundai Sonata. And I believe that Sonata was actually taken to the lab for, for different sorts of testing. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So swabs were taken from the steering wheel. What do you do with that? Um, so I basically cut the cotton from those swabs and again took that through the DNA testing process. And what was the result? Um, the DNA profile obtained is consistent with the mixture of at least three individuals, including at least one male. The major contributor profile matches exhibit 57A, BJ Brown. And due to the limited minor contributor profile obtained, the minor contributor profile is inconclusive for comparison purposes. So we know that Mr. Brown's DNA was on the steering wheel of the Hyundai Sonata. That's correct. All right. And you give a, another statement here on your lab report after identifying Mr. Brown. What, would you tell the jury what that is and what it means? Yes, there is a statistics statement. Um, basically, this, this gives weight when there is a match between a DNA profile from a piece of evidence and a known individual. All right, in this case, what was, what was that, that statistic? The probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual who would be included as a contributor of the DNA profile is one in a number greater than the current world population for the African-American, Caucasian, and Southwestern Hispanic populations. So it was Mr. Brown's DNA? Essentially, yes. Okay. I'm going to hand you another exhibit here. I'm not going to ask you to open it, but can you identify it based on the markings from the outside? If we have yes. to open it, we can. <clears throat> what, um, what is that? This um, contains a Gatorade bottle. This was collected from the Hyundai Sonata. Um, it has a unique laboratory number for this case, the exhibit number, and my initials are also present. All right, is that TBI exhibit 27A? It is. All right, and you said it was taken from the, the Hyundai Sonata, the same vehicle? Yes. All right, and did you perform, perform testing on that? I did. All right, tell us the results of that, please. Um, so I swabbed the mouth area and inside the cap of the Gatorade bottle, and the DNA profile obtained matches exhibit 57A, BJ Brown. Okay. Your Honor, has to make that Gatorade bottle the next exhibit, please. That would be exhibit uh, 52. 52. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kessler. I'm going to hand you another right here. Yes, this bag contains um, sweatpants and a jacket that were also from the Hyundai Sonata. Okay, is that exhibits 29A and B? Yes. All right. Did you perform testing on those items? I did. And what was the result of that testing? For 29A, um, that was the sweatpants. For the stain on the upper front left leg, presumptive chemical testing indicated the presence of blood. Presumptive immunological testing indicated the presence of human hemoglobin, a component of human blood. And the DNA profile obtained matches exhibit 57A, BJ Brown. I also swabbed the inside waistband and pockets of the pants, um, attempting to potentially um, find DNA of the person that might have been wearing the pants. And the DNA profile obtained is consistent with the mixture of at least four individuals, including at least one male. And the major contributor profile matches exhibit 57A, BJ Brown. And the limited minor contributor profile was inconclusive. So Mr. Brown's DNA was on 29A, the pants. That's correct. All right. And then 29B? So 29B was the jacket. Um, for the stain on the left side next to the pocket, presumptive chemical <laughs> testing indicated the presence of blood. 
and presumptive immuno immunological testing indicated the presence of human hemoglobin, a component of human blood, and the DNA profile obtained matches exhibit 57A BJ Brown. Um, similar to the pants, I also swabbed the inside neckline, sleeve cuffs, and pockets. And the DNA profile obtained is consistent with the mixture of at least three individuals, including at least one male. The major contributor profile is consistent with exhibit 57A, BJ Brown. And the limited minor contributor <coughs> profile was inconclusive. All right. So Mr. Brown's DNA was also on the jacket. That's correct. All right. Your Honor, I'd ask to make that the next collective exhibit, please. Collective exhibit 53. Agent Castellano, just a couple of more here. Yes, <clears throat> this is a blue rag um, that was collected from the Hyundai Sonata. All right. Is that TBI exhibit 30A? Yes, it is. Okay. You performed testing on that as well? I did. And what was your findings there? Um, for the stain in the corner, presumptive chemical testing indicated the presence of blood. Presumptive immunological testing indicated the presence of human hemoglobin, a component of human blood. And the DNA profile obtained matches exhibit 57A, BJ Brown. All right. Has to make that the next exhibit, Your Honor. <clears throat> That's number 54. 54. So in Castle Bunner, that's really four separate items that were all taken from the Hyundai Sonata that had Mr. Brown's DNA on it. That's correct. And then we also had the swabs from the steering wheel. Yes. Okay. I'm going to pass you forward one more, and I'm going to ask you to open this one. We've got some gloves for you if you need it. Actually, you tell us what's in here. This is um, a pair of Nike um, Jordans. Is that TBI exhibit 51A? It is. All right. And before we get into the package there, did you perform testing on those? I did. All right. And were you able to determine if there was DNA inside of those shoes? Um, presumptive chemical testing did not indicate the presence of blood and the inside of both shoes were swabbed and testing for real time P testing with real time PCR was inconclusive for the presence of human DNA. Um, so no further testing was performed. Okay, so we couldn't tell if there was DNA in there or not. Correct. And where were those, you have a notation here on 51A, they were collected from a shed? That is correct. Right. Agent Castlebono, if you would open those up for us, please. <clears throat> You can probably find a knife around here if you need one. Judge, I object to the relevance of the shoes. There's no DNA to prove that they're there's I would may need a jury out, Judge, before we get into that then. Ladies and gentlemen, you know the drill, sorry. <clears throat> But uh, we have a pair of Air Jordan shoes, if I understand correctly. They are orange Air, Nike Air Jordan shoes, Your Honor. The relevance is in the McCaskill video that we can see, he's wearing shoes that are similar to that. The video is not complete, you can't tell for sure, but he's wearing shoes that are similar to that. And the shoes were found in a shed where Mr. Brown was also found. Um, when he was apprehended, finally, he did not have shoes on. Um, so that's the reason that we're wanting to put them in So evidence. what you're saying is that these were the shoes that he would have had on allegedly in the video of the body cam and dash cam yes, video. Sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and that when he was found later, he was not wearing shoes, but those shoes were nearby. They, they were already in custody, actually. They were, they were taken from the shed that he was in at one point. Right. There was no foundation 
laid for what shoes he was wearing when the video was played. There's no chain of custody been established as far as this pair of shoes is concerned. Why is this witness even necessary to introduce those shoes? Wouldn't it be more appropriate to have the person who found the shoes introduce them? Judge, it certainly would, but if I did that, then Mr. Spratt could make the same chain of custody argument. What I will do, if the court allows, I will enter the shoes for ID purposes because Agent Castlebono did perform testing on them. She would be in the chain of custody, so I had to have her testify about those I think shoes. that would be the appropriate way of doing it, which is allow the shoes to be introduced for identification purposes, but not for evidentiary purposes at this point. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Well, we're ready for the jury to come back in. Is this our last witness for the day? Yes, Your Honor. Is that the pair of shoes, uh, I believe it was TBI exhibit 51A from the shed? It is. And did you perform the testing on those? I did. Your testing was inconclusive, is that right? That's right. All right. Your Honor, asked to introduce those as an exhibit for identification purposes only. I'm working for identification purposes as identification only exhibit A. Exhibit A for identification. Agent Castlebono, uh, we, what we've been going through are your findings, and those are all detailed in your report. Is that correct? That's correct. Is that a complete report that I handed you earlier? It is. You aren't asked to make that the next exhibit, please. 55. Exhibit 55. Those are my questions. <clears throat> I want to get this right. Is it Castelbono? Castelbono. Castelbono. Bono. Okay. All right. Agent Castelbono, did um, so the shoes that you identified those had no DNA on them. Period. Did they? Um, my results were inconclusive. Your so results were inconclusive as to whose DNA that was. Period. If there was DNA or not, I couldn't tell. That's correct. Okay. And you you got into the. Uh, The vehicle and there were several people that had been in that vehicle hadn't there or at least unidentified people right there were there was dna in that vehicle as far as the dna results right yes from multiple individuals yes not just mr brown that's correct okay those are my questions you know any further no sir. thank you agent you may step down we're releasing you from your subpoenas so you may go about your business all right, gentlemen, if I understand correctly, that concludes the list of, list of witnesses you have for today. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to adjourn for the day.